Okay, well, welcome everyone. So glad that everybody was able to make it today. Let me kind of move everybody around so I can actually see what I'm doing. So welcome and thank you for joining us for the State of Oklahoma's GIS Standard Concept Class. The State of Oklahoma 9 Management Authority in partnership with the Oklahoma Office of Geographic Information is hosting a series of courses in support of Oklahoma 911 and GIS community in the migration to next generation 911. We have several members of the Oklahoma State team with us today to include Lance Terry, Oklahoma State 911 coordinator. Lance, would you like to share a few words with our attendees this morning? Yeah, thank you very much, Sandy. Everybody, I appreciate your time um, and, and work uh, as we move forward with GIS in the state of Oklahoma. Um, this is, you know, this is taking several months, if not years, to, to come to fruition. Um, this is uh, being brought to you by a, a federal grant along with state funds. So that's how we, fund, we funded this training program. Um, GIS is the really the pillar, uh, the, the, the pillar cornerstone of, of Next Gen 911. And so, and, and even today, uh, when, we, when we look at uh, transferring calls from neighboring agencies and things like that. We had an incident just last week um, uh, of an incident where one county transferred to somebody else. They didn't have their mapping data and the call was delayed. So, you know, there's a there's a definite need in today's environment to have shared mapping data. That shared mapping data needs to be the same exact data set. So that's what we're driving to get. We also have problems in rural Oklahoma with Google um, you know, not being able to map addresses and things like that. So we've got a plan to work with the federal government to use um, uh, the national address database uh, to upload this statewide data set into that NAD database and then keep it fresh. And then that's where Google will come and get it for our statewide maps. So we hope that we can leverage all of this work that you're doing uh, to, to not only benefit 911, when someone's, you know, at their weakest moment in their life, calling 911 for help, uh, you know, to, to help with that, but also to help with other aspects of emergency uh, uh, response. So when you look through the through the standard, it is going to be a little different than what you see in other standards around the country because we have a lot more optional data. And I think that's the one thing I want to point out because the optional data is something we may not cover, but you know, bridge impediments, speed limits, and all of that, if we can capture that data as we go along, that will help us with police, fire, EMS response as we continue to grow into more of a, uh, a, a artificial intelligent type systems that allow us to leverage all of this data to speed up response. Um, there's several state statutes or, or, or uh, there's a lot of um, uh, legislature that's being being pushed out there right now to send the closest fire units, not just because it's their jurisdiction, but send the closest fire company that's there. Well, the only way that a dispatcher can do that and do it quickly is if we have a strong GIS data set. So all this stuff has got to be built upon this. So no pressure, no pressure, but GIS is the cornerstone. It's the pillar. So we've got to work with your neighbors. We've got to get, we, we've got to make sure that edge matching is strong. We've got to make sure that we're, that we're, working together. If there's questions, we can't just go solo on our own. We've got to work as a, as a strong team. And we're talking about hundreds of folks that's got to come together to make this happen. So I appreciate your eagerness. I appreciate you guys being on this call today and, and being involved in this initial training. You may find in this training that it's beyond what you're able to do, and that's okay. We've got six vendors that, that we've uh, that we've contracted with. So on the state contract, there's six vendors that you can contract with. Right now, we have uh, over a million dollars available uh, to get your data um, up to standard. So there's a grant available for that. It's an 80-20 grant. There's a lot of people already taking advantage of that. The window is closing on that. So if you're interested in jump-starting your data and getting it where it needs to be at, we've got money to make that happen. Um, and then you can maybe be able to maintain it as we go along. So, you know, www.ok.gov forward slash 911, www.ok.gov forward slash 911. Go to our website, check out our grants, look at the GIS data that's there. And um, I don't want to suck up your whole four hours because I probably could, but uh, I do appreciate everyone that's on this call today. 
Um, it's going to, again, take a team effort to make this happen. Please work with your neighbors. Do not work in a vacuum. Um, this is something that's got to be done statewide and also multi-state. So we got to look at our neighbors and in other states. So with that, um, again, I appreciate each and every one of you. And I appreciate everybody that's put this thing together uh, to make it happen today. So Sandy, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and I, I really want to echo what he's saying. Uh, I, I think for a long time, uh, even from, and I'm a public safety background, I had a hard time getting my administration to understand that GIS is a part of dispatching. We use it in so many components of what we use within the 9-1 center, yet every time I would try to approach uh, levels of administration throughout my state uh, to actually train folks on GIS, give them, give them an understanding, the biggest pushback I got was they're dispatchers, they do that well, they don't need to know GIS, not realizing the value and how much you need to use it within your comm center. Um, and the other uh, thing I want to point out that Lance said is, is also very important is I think the goal is to not have duplicative efforts here. Let's not have multiple GIS data sets out there. Let's build to, towards a common goal, a common goal that can be used from the state and local level and makes interoperability much more possible, not only within the state, but um, when you cross borders, because I know some of your 9-1 centers are working with adjacent states on uh, trying to get emergency responders out. That's true of everywhere. I know that we also have like Shelly or Charles or Barbara. Did you guys want to take a moment as well? Or I'm not putting you on the spot. I just want to make sure that we acknowledge, acknowledge the rest of the state team. Okay, fantastic. All right, so folks, um, like I mentioned before, we are recording the session. Um, all of you have been muted for quality assurance purposes and that's it, but you should have the ability to unmute yourself. And we do wanna ask you to do that, ask questions, raise discussion points. We want this to be an interactive session for you. Um, we, just, we don't want you to sit there and have to listen just me and Annie talk the whole time. That's, the, that's just too boring. Um, we do have the chat though. So if you're not comfortable unmuting or in uh, approaching us verbally, there is the chat and Sarah Rollins, one of my team members, is with us and she's gonna help me manage the chat um, while Annie, cause Annie will be doing most of our discussions today. Annie, as my co-presenter, would you like to introduce yourself, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Annie Cahill and I am a GIS technical manager with Datamark. Um, I live here in Virginia and I spent about 15 years uh, in local government in Virginia doing GIS. Um, so I'm a technical manager with Datamark I lead all of our strategic planning efforts uh, regarding GIS and next generation 911 for all of our clients. I provide technical oversight to all of our projects nationwide, and I also lead our boundary facilitation efforts. Um, I am on the board of directors for GITA, which is the Geospatial Information Technology Association, and also for the GIS Certification Institute. So um, just want to say thanks for having us today. I'm looking forward to really diving into GIS with you guys and uh, getting to know the standard a little bit better. Thank you, Annie. And then, uh, folks, I won't bore you with mine. Um, I am a traditionally public safety role. Uh, started in 1990 as a public safety dispatcher. I have had the blessing and the curse of uh, growing up in 911. When I started, my county did not have 911, and I've grown up through enhanced, wireless, phase zero, phase one, phase two, and then um, also was part of my uh, state of Arizona 911 program office in our early adopter to next generation 911 and geospatial routing. In my role as a project manager with the state 91 office, uh, I handled everything from PSAP operations, wireless deployments, GIS, and NG911, any, anything that had to do with 911, much like Lance, Lance's office does. Um, it's it really the um, being an early adopter uh, taught me a lot uh, and, and how much I appreciate how Oklahoma is addressing. Uh, not only GIS for next generation I want, but the education efforts behind it, because I, I find that very valuable. Okay, so let's learn more about you. And we're going to use a poll to get you familiar with polls, because we're going to have some polls throughout the day. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to launch the poll. And there are three questions to it. What best describes your role? And this is multiple choice. Um, so if you're a 911 public safety professional, 
Um, but you also do GIS. Go, feel free to click both if you're a GIS professional, but you're also the addressing authority, if you wouldn't mind that as well. Um, what level of support do you offer? Are you a technician, an analyst, a dispatcher, a supervisor, a manager, third party support? It's important for everyone to realize that if you do hire someone to support you, that uh, the third party support has to be familiar with the standard and has to apply your standards. The, the, the standard that we're going to discuss today. So if you um, have third party support, um, already uh, acquired, then please encourage them to attend the training because they need to be familiar with the standard. And then which best describes your level of experience in your field? Zero to three years, four to six, seven plus. I'll just give that a couple more. Okay, and so while you're completing the poll, just a couple of housekeeping, we are going to take breaks. We, we strategically place breaks, what we think is going to be good, um, a good transition uh, between topics, um, it, but definitely before each one of the modules. They will be 10 minute breaks um, because we don't really have an ability to know when everybody's back in their seat. We have to cut, we have to start on time. There's just really no way to know in this environment if everyone is back in their seat. Um, like I've already mentioned, we do want this to be interactive. We encourage you to ask questions um, and you, you can do this by unmuting or through the chat. Um, but for better sound quality and a positive learning experience, if you could remember to mute yourself when you're not actually um, a, part of a part of a conversation. Now, today's training has been set up in four different modules um, based on the requirements set forth by the state. So we're gonna do a GIS overview. We're gonna do an introduction to, to the GIS data models and the Oklahoma standards specifically. We're gonna move into module three, which is better understanding of the standard and the requirements. And then we're gonna have uh, the last portion just kind of pulling it all together. Um, what is it that I th else I think you need to um, know? Okay, so you may notice that a lot of slides have a great deal of content on it that was done purposefully. Um, we wanted to, first of all, highlight aspects of the standard. So if you review the PowerPoint at a later time, then it's, it's right there at your fingertips. It's not the entire standard, but those important points. And because this is a standard we'll be discussing today, we wanna um, make sure that we are using the words of the standard that we're not doing any type of inference or misinterpretation of the standard itself. And we do appreciate uh, members of the Oklahoma team being with us today as they're the ones who developed the standard. So if there are questions that perhaps uh, Annie and I uh, cannot answer because we're, we weren't part of the development, they can. Okay, so let's go ahead and share the results. Thank you for completing that. And it looks like we have a really good balance between public safety GIS and addressing authorities. That's fantastic. Oh, and a really good span of, of um, experience. So that's fantastic as well. So the beginning of the presentation uh, is going, or the presentation, the training today is going to be uh, a GIS basics. Um, but that is, uh, so that may seem fairly remedial for some of you, but would truly appreciate if you hang on uh, during that part of the the class. Okay, enough about that. Why is my thing not working? My keyboard. Okay, now, uh, last night before the class, I did, um, I emailed out a, uh, how to find a standard. I, I had a flaw in the link, but I, I, I think I corrected that. So how to find the standard. There is a technical glossary in the standard. We, um, while we're going to try our best not to use acronyms or at least explain the acronyms that we're using, the technical glossary in section 4.05 um, has the description of, of most of the acronyms that we'd, we would be using today, but please feel free to stop us um, if you're not understanding something that we're saying. All right, Ms. Annie, are you ready to get started? On mute, right? Let's yes, rock and roll. I'm good. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Um, and Sandy, you wouldn't mind operating the slides to advance. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so for module one, we're really getting into what is GIS. Now, as Sandy said, a lot of this is going to be remedial, but um, it's, it's good for the folks who really don't have 
a solid understanding of GIS, or maybe they're curious, um, maybe it's something that they use as part of their job, but they don't really know a whole lot about it, or they're curious, right? So um, let's explore what GIS is. So we go to the next slide. So GIS really is a system, okay? It stands for Geographic Information Systems, all right? And so what that means is, it means that there's a, a very important marriage between geography and information, all right? Now, if you think about the days when we would use paper maps, I mean, maybe some of us still do, um, but I think most of us have transitioned to GPS by now. Anyway, if we think about um, the days when paper maps were very popular, we were very limited to the information that the cartographer showed us or the map maker, all right? There's only so much information that you can pack onto a map. Um, so with GIS, we have the capability to bring in information for a very dynamic mapping experience, okay? So GIS really consists of hardware, and the hardware can be uh, things like your servers, um, your PCs, your plotters, um, your GPS equipment, the software that's required. So I think, and, and really my experience has been with all of our clients, um, they've all been Esri shops. Um, but there are open source GIS available as well, such as QGIS. Some of you might have experience with QGIS. Um, so the software, um, the data, so the data can be uh, tabular or spatial. So tabular meaning that um, it can be found in a table. And that's the great thing about GIS is that it can consume data that's tabular um, or data that's spatial, obviously. Um, and then, of course, the people. You have to have the people who are qualified to run it all, okay? And, and the main takeaway here is that all of this has to work together to have something that runs well and is efficient, okay? So we can use all of these components to manage, analyze, display um, all the different types of, of GIS data that we can imagine, all right? I'm going to go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so one of the great things about GIS is that it really allows us to frame questions geographically, okay? M most people are visual learners. Um, we can ask questions such as, where is it? <laughs> how far away is it? Um, what is it near? Um, how do I get to it? And in the case of something, say, like a weighted suitability analysis, where is the best location for X? Okay, so for example, um, if a locality is trying to determine the best location for a new park or, say, um, a new fire station, you might want to consider doing a weighted suitability analysis. All right, and that's going to help you determine the best location for that based on other factors that you've determined uh, before you've initiated that analysis. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so a little bit of the history behind uh, GIS. It really started um, in the 1960s as part of the Canada Land Inventory System, okay? And it then expanded in the 1970s into uh, universities and other higher learning uh, institutions. And then we really saw it expand commercially in the 1980s with these bigger names. So Bentley, Esri, and Erdast, um, Bentley with the CAD platform. And if you ever hear a GIS person refer to CAD, it's not uh, computer-aided dispatch, it's computer-aided drafting. Um, typically, that's what we mean when we say CAD. Um, but a lot of places are still using Esri today. Um, that is by far uh, one of the most popular software companies that we see. Now, the, the important thing to note here about the history behind this and why it's important to mention this is because um, if you're really not familiar with GIS at all or you've never interacted with it in your locality, you're not sure if you have a GIS office, because GIS originated for land management, um, we really see it used widely in planning departments. That's kind of where GIS started. So a lot of your GIS people, they might be planners. Um, and of course, now we can see GIS in lots of different places today, right? So uh, you might have a GIS person in public safety or your GIS might be integrated with your IT department. That's very popular, especially throughout Virginia. But if, you, if you're really not sure where to start, um, your planning department surely can direct you to the right location as far as where GIS is located uh, within your locality. 
All right. So really, GIS obviously uses geospatial data. Um, this is data that describes the location and characteristics of a spatial feature, right? So, um, for example, you know, roads occupy a space and have different characteristics. Okay, that's what we mean by geospatial. It occupies a space and it has characteristics that describe it. Okay, and we'll explore that a little bit later. Um, but really with GIS, we can input data, we can store and manipulate it. Okay, so for example, um, uh, for the manip manipulation part of things, we may download a state data set, but we only care about what the data is that's in our locality. So a way that we can manipulate that for our business needs is we can just clip it. We can do geoprocessing and clip. That's just one very simple form of manipulation. Uh, we can query data, okay? We can also analyze and then we can um, identify patterns and visualize all of those things on a map. Now, one example that I can give you of this is um, in my community a long time ago, we had a man who blew up his own house. Now, Thankfully, the man was okay, um, but we had to go out and collect some data. We also had to provide mapping for the Commonwealth Attorney's Office um, because this was uh, a legal issue, obviously. And so we had to obtain data from our building permit department, our inspections department, and that data contained information about which houses were reporting damage due to the blast. Okay, and of course, um, depending on the proximity, some of the damage was greater, right, the closer you get to the blast site. So what we were able to do was join that inspection data to our own addressing data, and we were able to plot that on a map. And what was really cool is we could visualize that blast pattern on the map um, and also identify some, <laughs> some structures that were reporting damage that were considered outliers. So these may have been people who wanted a new roof on their house or wanted their windows replaced um, because they were they were very far outside of the of the blast area. So it, it's just a, a great way of visualizing. Um, another example would be every month the police department would provide me with a basically a report of vehicle larcenies. Okay. And it was this is very simple, but it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So they would provide me with an example. <clears throat> I would plot those on the map and Obviously, as you go through the course of the year, you would notice that the larcenies would increase during the warmer months, okay? So it's cold outside. Nobody wants to break into anybody's car, but once the weather gets warmer, you see that start to increase, and also because um, kids are home from, from school during the summer. So it's, it's, a, it's a great way to, to visualize things um, based on the information that's available. So GIS has a lot of power. So GIS also models reality, and you know we have to ask ourselves how how can we make it so um, things like address points or road center lines or uh, water features, any of these types of things, become available and be brought into the digital world so that we can work with it in a way that we can perform some type of analysis. Um, so basically. What we do is we we create vector data, okay, and we'll explore that here in another slide. But but really, we use GIS to model reality, and that essentially um, allows us to do statistical analysis. It allows us to query against the databases, and then in turn, we can identify different patterns, relationships, and situations from that data. All right, so. Uh, vector data is really one way that we can model uh, the real world, okay? So when we talk about bringing things into a geospatial environment where we can work with them and analyze and query and do all of those types of things, we have to find a way to, to represent that data in GIS, okay? And one of the ways that this is accomplished is through vector data, all right? So vector data really is based on XY coordinates, and we use different types of vector data to represent different features, right? So points, points can be things like obviously address points, um, historical monuments, uh, things like wells or fire stations or fire hydrants, all of these things that can be represented with a single XY, okay? Uh, line features would be things that are linear in the real world, okay? So things like street center lines, railroads, um, streams. All right. Polygons. Polygons represent areas. 
Okay, so so probably the the best example I can give you is political boundaries. Okay, um, you have uh, country boundaries, uh, state boundaries, county boundaries. We all interact with those. On a more personal level, if you are a property owner, your property is most likely stored in a GIS somewhere. The the coordinates, okay, that define your property boundaries. So different ways to represent different types of data. Okay, and the thing about vector data is that we do have the ability to examine the relationships, not only between the data um, features themselves within the data set, but also between others. Okay, so one example would be um, all road center lines with the same name should be snapped at the vertex um, or uh, all address points for my locality should be contained within my polygon. All right, so it examines relationships again among the features themselves and then among other data sets, right? So we can go to the next slide. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to chime in. Okay, so storage formats, um, generally we see shapefiles and geodatabases. Okay, shapefiles are great because it's just a, it's just a normal um, exchange format. Uh, it's, it's, it's very open source. You can open it really in any GIS uh, software. Um, and many systems today consume GIS uh, shapefiles. So uh, a lot of CAD systems, asset management, permitting systems are still using shapefiles um, to feed data into their various systems. Okay. Um, GIS data, uh, geodatabases, I mean, are preferred for managing data for several reasons. Um, but for the purposes of this class, the main advantage is that they do have the ability to leverage domains um, as well as some other, other data options that we can talk about here in the future. So, all right, so it's time for our first or second poll. Um, which type of storage format do you use predominantly for your GIS data? Use a shapefile or a geodatabase, or you don't know. Well, if you don't know, just put neither. I, I didn't put an I don't know there. It didn't. I don't know why I didn't. My apologies. Oh. I'll, I'll update. Uh, you, yeah, you should have realized that I'm going to be on this call, <laughs> and so I need a bunch <laughs> of I don't know. My apologies. It won't happen again, sir. Now, Annie, can't shapefiles be problematic? Yeah, I mean, shapefiles, you know, look, I, I love shapefiles. They're, they're quick, they're easy. You, could, you just do a quick export of your data. But really, especially for the purposes of when we start talking about the Oklahoma standard, um, we really need to take a thoughtful look at how we're maintaining our data today. Um, because with a geodatabase, you actually have a lot more functionality. Um, the ability to use domains is huge and subtypes and um, have topologies. You can't do any of that with a shape file. Okay, so you definitely have more functionality with geodatabases. Plus you have your version editing, which you can do from a geodatabase. And you can't currently do that with a shape file. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have a, a good mix. With, um, name file extensions, don't they get cut off? Yes. Oh, I forgot about them. that. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, there are some restrictions as far as, um, as far as naming conventions with the data itself, as well as the fields within the data. So there are lots of reasons to use the geodatabase. We're not telling you to abandon your shapefiles, because obviously, if your systems rely on shapefiles, you need to keep using those. Um, but, you know, you, you might want to consider the transition in the future. Okay, so we are all kind of familiar with this, even if we might not know the official name. Um, raster data is really meant to represent continuous data, okay? Uh, raster data is basically a matrix of cells organized into rows and columns to represent continuous data, all right? So most of us will interact with raster data um, as far as like uh, aerial imagery or satellite imagery, but it can also be used to show things like precipitation or temperature. All right, so just different types of raster data. Just be aware that that's what that is. So that's that's actually used to represent continuous data, whereas vector data vector format is for discrete data. 
Okay. So now that we've covered how attributes, or I'm sorry, how the, how the geography portion is covered as far as representation within GIS, now it's time to look at the information part. Because remember, GIS is geography and information. Okay. So the way that we show that within GIS is through attributes. Okay. Now let me just kind of do something abstract here. When we talk about attributes, we're talking about what describes something. Okay. So if I think about my dog, I said, this is what's abstract. My dog, um, his name is Jeffrey. He's a Boston Terrier. Okay. So his attributes are, he has huge eyeballs. He has a, a smushed in face. Um, he's black and white. Um, he's also kind of rude. So there are different attributes that we can use to describe something, anything, okay? And the same goes for GIS. So what we can do here is we can actually organize our attributes in a table, okay? And the way that we organize that is called a schema, okay? It's kind of a funny word, but basically a schema refers to how we organize those attributes and how those attributes are stored within the data that's describing the feature. All right, so in our first example, we have fire hydrants, okay? We see the geography on the right, fire hydrants are represented with points, okay? But each fire hydrant has a number associated with it. It has a pressure that's associated with it, and it's got the date that it was tested. Okay, if we go to the next example for address points, very similar. And I'm sure that all of you who have interacted with address points, you understand this, right? So address points um, can have a, a USPS data element, right? That corresponds with um, address field, which you can also find in your 911 databases. All right, so attributes really kind of span um, the different systems. They can span different databases. And we can maintain our attributes differently in different databases. All right. Similarly to, with road center lines, um, road center lines may have a pre-directional. They may not. Okay. They also have a name um, and then they'll have a street type and then possibly a post-directional. Those are just examples of some attributes that can be stored within this different type of data. But the important takeaway here is that GIS allows you to link the information with the geography. The geography alone is valuable, right? Like we can still do some limited analysis with just the geography, but you have so much more power and so much more functionality when you're maintaining all of the attributes about those data sets. All right, with a map, you just get a picture. And that's the, that's the takeaway here. So we can go to the next slide now. And for public safety folks um, who are not necessarily GIS inclined, your attribute table can be exported as an Excel spreadsheet and still allows you to participate in the GIS process, if you will. So when, when I started, I would just have my GIS analyst send me, you know, the attribute table with all my errors uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. And that allowed me to participate in our error corrections and resolutions that needed to happen in a format that I was comfortable with and familiar with versus having to rely solely on uh, the GIS department to assist me with that. Okay, so here's another poll question. There's not tons of these, um, so don't, don't, um, don't feel like it's gonna happen too frequently, but if you could share with us, do you use GIS data today? Here, so Lance, I gave you kind of an I don't know. I said, I think so. I use a map as part of my duties. And then- Thank you. You're welcome. And what GIS layers, layers do you use or maintain? Now, this, this, if you joined us for the meet and greet, and we had kind of a similar poll question, um, but it had a lot more GIS data layers. Um, some of those were NG91 related, and since we haven't gone into an NG91 discussion, I didn't include those um, as part of uh, this poll itself. Very good. Looks like there's a really good. Um, really good uh, level of data out there. Fantastic. I'll give it just a couple more seconds and then we'll go ahead and move on. Nice. Oh, good. I'm glad that we have a lot of people who are using GIS 
regularly. That's great to see. Okay, perfect. Sorry, cool. Danny. Thank you, Go guys. Ahead, Thanks, Sandy. Um, so now that we know a little bit about GIS data, um, we need to explore where do we get it. Um, so GIS data comes to us in many different forms. And like we mentioned earlier, um, we can actually consume lots of different types of GIS data um, or tabular data even. So they can come from databases. Okay, so um, for example, we um, in my locality, our office maintained the parcel data, just the geography though, right? So the, so the properties had a tax identification number associated with each one. All right, um, but that was pretty much all we maintained besides the basic shape information as far as the dimensions. Um, the tax assessment office maintained their own database that had all the information associated with that property. So the property owner, the um, gosh, the assessed value, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the, the selling price, like all this different type of information. And we were able to join the database to our parcels by the tax identification number because they were the same in both databases, right? Um, so, so we can consume databases within GIS. We can even bring Excel spreadsheets in with a little bit of manipulation, all right? We can also use digitized maps um, if people are still out there digitizing maps. Um, we can use uh, GPS field collection this is very, very common. We work with a lot of clients who, as part of their addressing process, they use a GPS unit to collect the driveway or property access, as well as uh, where the actual structure location is. So GPS field collection is still very big. Uh, aerial photography and remote sensing. Um, does the state have a, a contract uh, for aerial photography, or is it more at the local level where folks need to need to get their own aerial imagery locally. Hmm, I don't know that. I, I uh, if if the state participates in the NAPE program, they may be able to get free aerial imagery from USDA. And okay. and honestly sometimes NAPE imagery is better in rural areas than it is in cities. Yes. Yeah, I believe we've got new maps that were updated uh, at okmaps.com uh, or okmaps.net. Charles or, or Shelly, you could chime in if you can. Uh, where, where can we get the latest uh, statewide imagery at? Okay. You can I'll... get the 2019 um, Nate photography for the state from okmaps. There's also multiple years from the past if you're looking for past imagery. So it is all on okmaps. And I will have Charles put that link in the chat so that we can, people can go to that site and be able to get to it. Yeah, let me work on that and I'll get you the link in the chat real quick. And then Barbara says that um, they're in uh, INCOG, they get theirs locally. She mentioned that in the chat. I, I didn't get that telepathically, just so you know. It's, got, it's because Tulsa has the deep pockets. Those are real deep pockets. They can, <laughs> they can reach way down there deep and get that money out. <laughs> By the way, that's 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 Chuck's wife, Barbara. It's Chuck Gibson on the chat window there. If you're in a specific city or county, there are certain counties and cities that, like Lance says, has deeper pockets that can that have that available. So if you're needing more accurate data than the the Nate photography, you might check in your county or city to see if that's available. Um, but as a statewide whole the Nate photography is what we have available. And one thing I will say about Nate photography that's different that I'll toss out there real quick. Nate photography, even though it might be fuzzy, it's in the right place. Um, whenever I bring up Nate photography next to my own, that's a, that's a higher resolution, it's still in the right place, it's just fuzzy. Um, whenever I bring my data into something like Google Earth, there is a shift. So if you map off of Google Earth, you're gonna see inaccuracies that are gonna have issues later on. <laughs> use NAPE yeah. as your base map. As your lowest common denominator, use NAPE. It's out there for everybody. Right. And and I know that, like I said, in Arizona, where we have a lot of dirt roads, you could at least see the dirt roads and they were in the right spot. And sometimes, and a lot of times commercial providers don't fly in those remote areas. Um, there isn't a profit to it. There's, no, there's not a reason to, uh, there's not a business need for it. I guess what a better, better way to describe it. 
There we go, Miss Annie. That was a good discussion. Thank you. Um, okay, so now is the most exciting part of GIS. <laughs> coordinate systems. There's two things, and I forgot to mention that I do teach a, a college course at GIS at a local community college, but um, there's two things that, that are not super exciting about GIS. The first is when we talk about coordinate systems, and the second is when we talk about metadata. So mute your lines, because if I hear anybody snoring, I'm going to get sad. Um, so anyway, coordinate systems really help us to model the earth. Okay, and, and I watched a video a long time ago um, where it was like actually a video from the 60s or 70s where they took an orange peel and they demonstrated how the orange peel needs to be flattened out to model the earth, right? So there's really two different types of coordinate systems. There's geographic, which are based on latitude and longitude locations, and then there's projected, okay? And a projected coordinate system, if you think about a projection, um, when you use a projector, what is it doing? It's it's projecting the image onto a wall, right? So it's the same with coordinate systems that are projected. They're taking something that's round, the earth is round-ish, and they're flattening it out to make it display on a 2D surface, like a screen or a piece of paper, okay? Coordinate systems, um, as boring as they are to discuss, are very important to Next Generation 911. Okay, um, and they are, they're critical. All right, so let's go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So as we mentioned with a projected coordinate system, we're taking something that's round and making it flat. Okay, and most of us, I think in our localities are using state plane coordinate system. At least that's what we do here on the East Coast. Uh, most of us are using state plane. But my state plane, Virginia North, is going to be different than um, what you guys would use in Oklahoma, okay? So the important takeaway here is that not all coordinate systems are created equal, and that's especially true for projected, okay? Because any time that you're, that you're taking something that's round and flattening it out, you're going to end up with error, or not error. You're going to end up with um, bent, bent data a little bit. Um, you're going to end up with data that's not entirely accurate as far as the representation in GIS because something has to has to give when you're flattening it out, right? And that's why um, when you explore these different types of coordinate systems, there's you know Web Mercator, Lambert conformal conic. There's lots of different types of coordinate systems, um, and you would use the same one for land that you would use if you were navigating in in the ocean. So it's just kind of that that whole point of understanding that there is distortion that is introduced with coordinate systems. So how can we solve that? Because the idea here to remember is that, you know, taking yourself out of your own locality and understanding that Next Gen 911 is not just about my community. It's not just about my county. It's not even just about my state. It's about if I have a failure in my PSAP, there should be a PSAP six states away who can route my calls. So for this reason, we have to have something that makes all the data fit together flawlessly. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so the way we accomplish that is through geographic coordinate system. And basically what that is, is it's understanding that the earth is not a perfect circle. Okay, and so what we do is we generate what's called a spheroid from that. It's, it's very complicated and nerdy, but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to calculate what the position of the spheroid is, right? And then we create datums based on that spheroid. So there are several different datums. Uh, NAD27 was in use for a long time. I think I'm hoping and praying that that's largely <laughs> been phased out in some localities. Wouldn't surprise me though, if people are still using NAD27 in places. Um, NAD83 is probably something with which most of the GIS folks are familiar with. Um, and then there's WGS84, okay? Um, there's a little bit of a difference uh, between WGS 84 and NAT 83, um, and there is a slight shift, but the entire NG91 system is based on GIS data being maintained in WGS 84. All right, so that's the important takeaway here. So we can go to the next slide. Well, and just um, to add to that conversation, it's not just the NG91 GIS, it's based off of WGS 84. Um, the wireless calls we receive today um, for our, mm -hmm. from our wireless carriers are also supported in WGS 84. 
Um, now there is a new coordinate system coming out. What it is, uh, well, st state plane 2022. Um, but I yeah. believe that 2022 has been pushed out at least a couple more years as, as that gets resolved. Uh, I don't believe next generation I one is going to go to state plane 2022, but if you hear your GIS folks mention it and ask about it, um, just rely back on for an NG91 purpose, WGS84 will be your datum. Okay, so moving on from the coordinate discussion, I hope that you guys are still awake with me here. Um, geocoding. So geocoding is essentially taking an address point and spatially identifying it along the road center line where it should be located based on what the address is. Okay, so we have, um, we have cross streets and then we have ranges associated with each road segment. Okay, and addresses should geocode appropriately along those center lines. Okay, you can have point-based geocoding, you can have linear-based, and then there can be a composite. And Sandy, I didn't know if you wanted to add any color there um, to the geocoding aspect as far as NG911 and uh, public safety systems, but um, this is the only slide that we have about geocoding, so um, we can take any questions about that as well. So the only thing that I'd like to share is that um, for next generation 911, uh, geo, geocoding to the road center line, um, geocoding a civic location, a physical address, a 911 call with a physical address to the road center line is only going to happen if one, you don't have an address point layer or two, an address point can't be found, then it will default to the road center line as like a, a fishnet, right? We wanna make sure that your call can be located somehow within the GIS and not default route. So if it doesn't find an address point, it will geocode to the road center line. The road center line um, can be developed in many different ways with real addressing, theoretical addressing, and a lot of times the road center line is a combination of both, right? Because GIS, just like 9-1 databases have been around for years and business needs um, have impacted how it rolls out. Real addressing is where if the only addresses are 5645, 5635 to 5645, or actually in this example, 5656, that would be indicative of real addressing, where theoretical addressing would be 5600 to 5699. And that can impact um, geocoding efforts, especially when you uh, consider PSAP routing. Um, where do I send that 911 call? And from a dispatch point of view can also impact uh, how real you, if you will, um, the location of the caller is. So I'm not, I'm not a proponent of real or theoretical. It's really a locally, local business need. But if from a dispatch point of view, you're noticing that um, calls are plotting on the road kind of very far from where you think they should be, it, this, it could be an impact of GIS. Thanks, Sandy. So the next thing we need to discuss is what is a GIS data model? Um, what is it? What is its function? What does it do? Um, so really a data model defines thematic data layers. Okay, so in the <clears throat> Oklahoma standard, what that data model is doing is it's telling us we need these different data layers with these features. All right, so for example, road center lines and address points. Okay, a data model also tells us how those need to be represented. So we're not gonna represent road center lines with points, right? We're gonna represent them with lines because they're linear features, all right? A data model also talks to us about the schema. It directs us about how we need to store those attributes and what those field types should be, all right? And it also may provide guidance about the topology, about the relationship. So for example, um, the county boundaries must be totally contained by the state boundary, or um, all of the address points must be located within my PSAT boundary, okay? And, ah, now we have our little ArcGIS demo. And let me see, Sandy, I can share my screen. I don't know if you need to stop sharing first. Okay. Share screen. 
please let me know if you guys can see this. I see. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so this is probably going to look familiar to a lot of you. Um, this is ArcGIS desktop. Um, I'm still using desktop. I haven't migrated to Pro yet. Um, I'm kind of stuck in my ways. But anyway, um, this is data that the state provided us for uh, the toolkit that we're testing, um, which we are building a next class for, and that's that's going to be course B2. And we'll have more information about that coming out soon. Um, so we've used Oklahoma data, and this data has been manipulated in different ways and things like that. So um, if you are the owner of this data, don't get upset because, you know, we've, we've just kind of made some changes and done things for testing for the toolkit. And we'll talk about the toolkit here in just a second. So what we've done here is we've added in some of our GIS data, okay? And these are all um, data layers that are required for NextGen 911. Um, as you add them into GIS, um, it really will create a hierarchy of display. So it'll always put the points on top, then any linear features, and then it'll it'll um, add the boundaries at the very bottom. Okay, and if you have any raster data, it will actually come down here at the bottom. Uh, so aerial photography, satellite imagery, et cetera. Okay, so address points. Um, road center lines and ESDs. Those are the three layers that we have turned on right now. All right, and there's a couple of different ways to look at the attributes of an address point or a road center line or an ESB. The most simple way is just to use the identify button to click. Okay, so I can see here, and I hope that's not being obstructed by the zoom, but if we look here, we can see that there's lots of different data that's maintained in this schema, okay? Now, remember that the schema is really the structure of what the attributes are supposed to look like for each feature. So every individual address point, every individual road center line, every individual ESB polygon or ESZ polygon will have features associated with it that are stored in its schema, okay? In this case, we call this an attribute table, all right? So we can see here that within the address points, um, the country is maintained, uh, the state, the county, and the city, all right? In this particular in circumstance, we see that uh, the point that we identified is 300 Michael Drive, and we can also see the ESN that it's located in. All right, and we can verify that ESN by doing a similar query on the ESN layer. So remember, our address point of 300 Michael Drive said we were in ESN 6213. We can verify that by looking at the actual ESN and seeing that it is 6213. Okay, so that's an example of the relationships between the data that are very important for next generation 911. All right, you have to think, what are the implications if my, if my um, address number had, if my address point had uh, the wrong ESN, maybe it had the neighboring ESN of 6200. What kind of issues would that cause in your data or in call routing for next gen 911? Okay. Um, so similarly, we can look at uh, Gina Lane. We can identify Gina Lane and we can see that it has an address range of 300 to 310. Um, we can see that um, the ESN is 6213, so that does reflect accurately what's in the data, and that the street name itself is Gina Lane. All right, now there are no pre-directionals, it's not North Gina Lane, um, there's no suffix directionals, and that's okay. But this is just an example of how individual attributes are stored within the GIS data, and every single feature is going to have attributes associated with it. Another way to view the attributes is by simply opening the attribute table, okay? So hey, this Andy, is, Andy, yes, real quick, can I, I want to kind of join in. I, this is Lance, and I don't have a lot of uh, GIS experience. I want to jump off the call here in just a second for another meeting, but these attributes that she's talking about, um, when we went live with our computer-aided dispatch system in, in Norman, 
these attribute, attribute tables had to be worked uh, heavily because we went to a, a GIS or a, a closest unit to the call uh, type system. And so mile per hour, speed limits, uh, bridge impediments, all those things had to be put into these road center lines in order to make that work. So, and you know, what I would, what I would ask for is to spend the time necessary to be as complete as possible because our, our, our future's changing and all of these different companies are continuing to, to add more and more features to their, to their software. And as they do that, they're going to require more and more information from your GIS data set. So pack these uh, attributes with the data that you have. Don't just go, well, I don't need that. No one doesn't need that. No one doesn't need that. Um, just, I, I beg you to do that because if you do it now, you want to do it later. Norman had to pay OU to do it because we had to, had to fast track it. So, um, you know, as we look at this and we approach it, um, don't limit yourself to just, well, these are just the main things I have to do, okay? Uh, and uh, because, you know, in the rural parts of, of, of Oklahoma, uh, there's a, I, I mentioned it earlier, there's legislation out there that says we need to send the closest fire unit. I venture to say in the next five to 10 years, we're going to have software programs out there that are going to be telling us who the closest units are. And it's going to be next to free. Um, so take the time, do it right, fill in these attributes and, and be as, and pack those, pack those things as, 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 as with as much data as you can. So Annie, sorry, I stepped on your toes if I didn't, uh, but that's just some of my experience. No, and that's, that's actually a really good point. And I'm, and I'm glad that, that you brought that up because, you know, we can't look at our data today and say, okay, what we're doing now is fine. So it's going to work for next gen nine one. It requires an entirely different mindset of how we look at the data. And Sandy is actually going to talk about that in the next module. And you're going to have a better understanding of how your GIS data is being used to route calls. Um, and you can't, you can't just leave it the way it is. That's, that's not an option. Doing nothing is not an option. Um, you absolutely must take a thoughtful look at the standard and see what your data needs as far as updating or creation. Okay, that's incredibly important. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, and the other thing is, and, and we'll talk about this more in a little while, you know, when we review the standard, the standard is what the state requires for next generation 911, okay? you're still going to continue maintaining your data locally for your business needs. Okay, so if your data has to support a permitting system, if your data has to support an asset management system, um, you're still going to need to, to maintain that. The state's not telling you, hey, this is how you have to, have to do it locally. It just means that you need to start thinking about, hey, how can I make next-gen data work with my current systems? Or if it doesn't, how can I develop an ETL process that's going to facilitate um, a better conversion of that data to meet those standards. Okay. And the toolkit will help you with a lot of that. So thank you for that discussion. Um, okay. So as far as the GIS data, really the, the point of this small demo was to just help you to understand that every feature has data associated with it. Okay. And in next generation on one, both of those things matter. Okay. You have to have, the, the feature, you have to have the geography, and you have to have the information, and it needs to be complete, and it needs to be accurate. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and then we can talk about the toolkit briefly. And Sandy, if you could share your screen again, that would be great. Are you seeing the demo? I am, yes. Okay, yes, fantastic. There you go. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so um, as we mentioned, the state is working diligently to develop a toolkit that will help you prepare your data for NextGen 911. Okay, uh, this is something that we are currently assessing and we are building the course for this toolkit. But we wanted to let you know this is out there. So as we continue our discussion, I don't want you guys to be super stressed out about, gosh, how am I going to get this done? This is, this is too hard um, because there is other help that's coming. Okay. And that's going to be in course B2. 
So keep your eyes out for that. And um, we hope that you will sign up for that because that has some really, really good information in it about how you can use these tools developed by the state to help prepare your data. Okay, so why don't we take a break? Uh, let's take about a 10 minute break. Actually, why don't we take 12? That'll make it easier. Um, so if we can return back at 1015 Central Time, uh, we'll get started again.
We're going to get started again in about two minutes. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started on the next portion um, of today's training. Um, Annie provided us in this in the first portion of the class an explanation of GIS, the basic concepts of GIS, and that was done in order to um, educate those of us who are not necessarily GIS inclined to have a better understanding of the environment that we'll be asking our 9-1 system to support going forward. Now, let's try to shift the conversation to 911 specifically and maybe help the GIS folks that are, that are attending the class uh, to have an understanding of why they're being asked to participate in our 911 system moving forward. I, I know that uh, for many of you, you already participate today. Uh, GIS is used in the 911 center. It's used for computer aided dispatch, it's used for automatic vehicle location, crime analysis. Closest unit response, like Lance had mentioned, it, it is already used in the 91 Center. Um, and for a lot of folks, they say, well, I already have GIS um, because I already use it for CAD and I use it for AVL and I use it for uh, my closest unit response. So I'm good. This NG91 thing isn't scary at all. I'm good. I have my data. And you're right. You, have, you do have your data and your data is going to be a really great starting point. But the most important thing to remember is what how your data is used today is after the 9-1 call is received. So the 9-1 call is received by the dispatcher, information comes in from the 9-1 system, and then it engages your GIS. GIS is not used today to support the actual 9-1 call routing, which is actually two, two different business needs, two different business needs separated by that golden 9-1-1 line. Let's talk about how 911 is supported today. We're going to talk about how 911 is supported tomorrow so we can get a better understanding of how the GIS may need to change to support the business need of call routing and the business need of dispatching units. Now, for every 911 call, there's actually two important factors. There are always two important factors. We have to know where this 9-1 call should go, what is the correct PSAP or public safety answering point. A public safety answering point is a fancy term for a 9-1 call center. So what is the right PSAP that this call should be sent to? And is my caller's location valid? Every 9-1 call has these two aspects. Without these two aspects, then the 9-1-1 call suffers from a delay in response. So what do I mean by that? Well, Say I have the correct location, but I send it to the wrong 911 center. We have a delay in response. Say I sent it to the right 911 center, but I have an improper location. We have a delay in response. So every 911 call has to be supported from these two aspects. Now, in today's environment, in the current 911 system, this is handled a little bit differently uh, than it will be in next generation 911. Um, we have some fair limitations to our current enhanced 91 system, and I'd like to go over how a 91 call is supported today to include the location data. Now, this is a generalized description of how a 91 call works. Um, this may be uh, descriptive of how it's done for you locally. Your uh, your 91 system may be slightly different. The reason that is is that 911 is very local. Uh, there's no federal funding for it. There's no uh, federal way of doing business, if you will. 
Uh, it is a very locally driven decision on what we're able to support and the resources that we have. Now, in this description, um, we're going to we're going to stick with a landline 911 call. 80% of our calls are wireless in nature, but wireless calls, voice over IP um, calls, every type of 911 call today is forced into this type of 911 network. So regardless of how the call originates, it has to, to take the same path. The path that's taken today, and the probably the biggest limitation to 911 today is the network that's in place utilizing a voice only analog, analog network. There is not the ability to transport data as part of the 911 call. And this is gonna be kind of confusing for dispatchers. I know the 12 years that I was a dispatcher, when I received my 911 call, everything was there, just magically showed up. I wasn't sure how that worked until I moved into what's called a master street address guide coordinator role, an IMSAG coordinator role. Then I started to understand how all this stuff worked and what actually was happening during my 911 call. So let's talk about that. So a 911 call is placed. Doesn't matter what the device is, a 911 call is placed. In the landline scenario, voice and telephone number are sent to the telephone company central office. The telephone company central office, the telephone company central office says, wow, that's a 911 call. I have a special path for that. And it sends out that voice and that telephone number to the 911 selective router. At the 911 selective router, there is a list of telephone numbers that are capable to um, access the, the um, public telephone network. And in that database, every telephone number is associated to an ESN, an emergency service number. And we'll talk about what those are in just a moment. The selective router looks up the telephone number, looks up the associated ESN. And that ESN says, send that call to PSAP A. We'll say it's the Ardmore PSAP. So it will send the voice and the telephone number to the Ardmore PSAP. And then once that call is received at the PSAP, the telephone number is sent out over special data circuits called alley circuits, automatic location information circuits. And it's sent out to the 91 database in order to capture the address associated to that telephone number it pulls that information, brings it back to the 911 center. And it happens so quickly, the dispatcher doesn't even notice that the voice and the telephone number came one way and the address came the other way to connect to them at the time that they answer the call. It's really fascinating. I love this stuff. Um, now your 911 database could be a local database. It could be sitting there locally within Oklahoma, or it could be um, if you have, if your telephone company has, or your 911 system service provider has an alley database provider, it could be going to another state in order to pull that information in. In our experience in Arizona, it was always going to Colorado to get that information. Now, in order for that 911 call, for that, telephone number and that um, ESN to get into the selective router database, there is some processing that has to happen prior to that. So um, this is gonna be, again, extremely high level overview of how this works, but let's talk about the functionality itself. The automatic location information or the alley is a database that includes a landline telephone line that has a physical connection for the delivery of a phone call. The alley database includes information such as a phone number, the customer name, the address of the customer. It is a customer database managed by the telephone company. When a new phone line for service is requested, the address information provided by the customer is verified against the Master Street Address Guide or the MSAG. Now the MSAG is a database that depicts the address ranges, street names and communities related to a specific area, say your city or county, much like a GIS road center line layer. The street ranges within the MSAG depict the potential addresses that a PSAP would support. The PSAP is assigned with the use of the ESN, the emergency service number, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Prior to a 911 call ever happening, when new phone service is received, the alley is verified against the MSAG as being MSAG valid, or the address 
is um, identifying that the address is a good address for the 911 system based on the address range, the street number and community name that was found within the MSAG. So very similar to geocoding an address point to a road centerline layer, the alley is looking for a place to reside within the MSAG. Once the alley is MSAG verified, the ESN is then assigned to the alley record instructing where to send the 911 call at the time that the, the 911 call is placed. So that information then gets placed into the selective router database, tying it forevermore. Whether or not this is gonna be a primary 911 call route or if someone needs to transfer the call, that, that ESN is tied to that relationship. Okay, so this again, this is a very simple, simplified explanation, but this is how validation of a location and the right 911 center is assigned within today's current 9-1 environment. And while it is a very simplified explanation of how we do business today, it's also an, a, a, an example of what we're asking GIS to do tomorrow. Because the GIS that we're putting in place through next generation 9-1 has to replace all of this capability. So both legacy and next generation 91 boundaries um, are used for the same purposes, to route calls and to define emergency responders. Now in the legacy environment, that's an ESN, an emergency service number, and it's a three to five digit number that's assigned to every MSAG record, just like we saw on the previous slide. And it will say, this is the 91 center that receives that 91 call, and this is the assigned law, fire, and EMS based on the geographic area of that location. In this description, let's call it a physical location, like your house. Wireless works a little bit differently, um, but we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole today. That's a completely different training session. Now, every ESN emergency service number has an ESZ associated to it, an emergency service zone. And it's the geographic area that represents the PSAP, law, fire, and EMS. Now, these same uh, identifiers are used in a next generation 91 system, but they're used as emergency service boundaries. Now you're, or actually I believe uh, they're just changing it, the term to service boundaries, but we'll stick with emergency service boundaries for this session. These polygons are just, if you will, a, a dissolve of the ESZ to just represent each one, the PSAP, the law, fire, and EMS as separate data layers. Um, there are some potentially some changes coming forward to where uh, these don't have to be uh, per the national standards, separate data layers, but as of today, based on the uh, National Emergency Number Association GIS data model version one, uh, they, they are separate boundaries. Now, what the minimum uh, boundaries needed for emergency service boundaries are going to be the PSAP law, fire and EMS. Those are required, but your service boundaries can be anything. It could be Coast Guard, uh, they could be your uh, poison control, they could be your dog catcher, they could be your tow boundaries. Whatever you want those service boundaries to be, they can be built within the 9-1 system. And much like Annie talked about today, in today's 911, granted it's after the call is received, we use GIS data. We use it to support our landlines. So when the 911 call comes in, um, you the dispatcher will receive an alley screen, a 911 call screen, and that, that physical or geodetic location with wireless calls, the latitude and longitude, is pulled from the 911 system. It's dropped into their CAD system a lot of times, and it's plotted up against their 911 mapping. The 911 mapping will either plot it to an address point, it'll geocode to a road center line, or again, if it's geodetic, it's just going to plot against, you know, obviously that geodetic location. And a lot of times for wireless calls, it's from the map that the dispatcher is pulling out the information on who is the law enforcement, the fire, or the EMS response for that specific location on the map. Now, it's important to understand that in a legacy environment, in the current MSAC environment, everything is supported by USPS Publication 28. Uh, these are the postal address standards. Uh, we're gonna talk about it uh, today, but that's shifting for next generation 911. Uh, the standard that will support those fields is the Civic Location Data Exchange format. It, it's, 
basically the same. The parsing is different. So in, in the USPS uh, model, it's, it's a four level parsing where in CLDXF it's eight or more. Um, and then the other uh, major difference between the data sets is uh, USPS uh, Pub 28 has you abbreviate. So Avenue would be like AVE and there are standardized abbreviations that follow USPS Pub 28. Where in CLDXF, everything is spelled out and everything is spelled out in order to uh, support interoperability, not just between your 91 center and the next 91 center over, but those beyond your state. So when you have to communicate with Texas or Arkansas or somebody that you, one of your adjoining states and you have to transfer that call, it's to support interoperability. Now, what's important to realize, um, and this was something that we ran into as part of an early adopter, is it's you really need to continue um, supporting the legacy elements of your GIS data that even though the NG91 standard has everything spelled out, within the standard itself, there are legacy fields in the schema, which uh, Annie's going to go over with you today. And going back to what Lance said, it's going to be very important you, you support those legacy fields. What we ran into with our uh, first geospatial routing deployment was uh, the PSAP was not, was not going to be able to participate because their CAD could not support uh, the field lengths that were associated to the NG91 fields. But because their GIS data provider was smart enough to complete every field, whether legacy or otherwise, we were able to deploy anyway. We continued to send a legacy alley and we were able to send that legacy information and no changes on their CAD side had to be done yet. But then when they upgrade their CAD and their CAD became uh, NG91 compliant, because the data already existed, it would be a minor change to shift the data to um, that next generation I want environment. So just keep that in mind, not just for legacy transitions uh, to support CAD stuff, but most of your local business needs are gonna be in a USPS publication 28 format, those much smaller uh, character fields. So now that we describe what, how we do business today, let's talk about how we do business tomorrow. So in next generation, I want GIS does become mission critical. I, I, I can't stress that enough. And um, while uh, there are federal dollars, as Lance mentioned, to get your GIS started, it's gonna be very important to recognize that since your next generation, I want network, the ability to locate my caller and route my 911 call will rely on GIS data. We need long-term sustainability of GIS, both from a public safety and a GIS point of view. And if you haven't started those discussions about what that long-term sustainability may look like, I really want to encourage you to do them now because it's, um, it can happen through cost sharing, it can happen through grants, um, it can happen through whatever means that you have locally, but it has to happen. There has to be long-term sustainability. I know for some states, uh, what that takes is even uh, viewing their governance, the legislation um, that supports their current 9-1 taxes and whether or not the legislation allows them to use 9-1 taxes to support GIS as part of their network. A lot of states are having to look at that because current legislation is written in very legacy terms, uh, not just from a tax, but then you may also wanna look at it from a, um, a lot of legislation has protections for dispatchers and others that support the 911 system, which could translate to the GIS providers that provide that support. But unless it's updated to take the legacy components out of it and to make it more timeless, if you will, to be able to embrace whatever type of 911 call may come in the future, uh, the legislation may not fully cover them. Just a little bit of a side note there. These are the required NG91 data sets per the state of Oklahoma GIS standard. So the road center line, address point, the PSAP boundary. Now the PSAP boundary is maintained by the state. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that in just a few slides. The discrepancy agency boundary, again, gonna go in more detail, but this boundary is really the boundary that says, if there's a problem in, in the NG91 network based on the GIS, who is responsible for that? Where do we send that? and current NINA standards, National Emergency Number Association standards, uh, NG91 
data management requirement document indicates depending on some of the errors to include GIS, it's a three business day turnaround. And a lot of GIS departments aren't currently able to support that. So again, needs to be part of those conversations moving forward. And then just like we already mentioned, our emergency service boundaries of law, fire, and EMS. So how do these play a role? So what happens within a next generation 9 system is, and let's again, take the example of a physical location. My address is 123 North Main Street, Queen Creek, Arizona. So my 9 call is gonna come in. It's gonna look for an address point first. If it doesn't find an address point, it will geocode to the road center line. But then what's gonna happen for our, my GIS heavy folks out there is what's called a point and polygon spatial query going to look at the point, the address point, the geocoded road center line, or the latitude and longitude point, and it's going to look to see what PSAP boundary encompasses it. And based on that PSAP boundary, that's the recommendation for the routing. So how does that work within the new network? So this is a high level description of a next generation 91 network. Um, not every component is here. Uh, we've only included the components that really are, are going to speak to the GIS location validation and call routing, but there are plenty other aspects to an NG91 network that are not represented. So when I say next generation 911, what does that mean? Well, technically folks, it's a complete replacement of how we do business today a complete replacement. So the first 911 call was back in 1968 in Haleyville, Alabama. And while we've seen improvements in our 911 network, um, we've really hit a limitation in what we're able to do. And the, probably the biggest limitation is call routing based on the caller's location. So while from a physical location point of view, whether that's gonna be the home or residence or the physical location of a cell tower, in our current network, we can plug that information in ahead of time and support call routing based on location. Um, because it's a voice only analog network, we're not really capturing the caller's location at the time of the 9 call. We're waiting on these tabular databases to support us um, when that call hits the network. So next generation 9 is completely replacing our voice analog network with what's called an ESINet, an emergency services IP network. It's a very fancy IP network. It is a closed network. You can't go to Amazon and buy something, um, but it is, it is a highly sophisticated network that's to support 9 call routing. This IP network uh, has the ability of both voice and data, which is probably one of the most important things about it voice and, and data. So we're in the, in the legacy environments, the voice and the telephone number, we go grab our data once it hits the 91 center. Data is collected at the time of the call. What type of data? The physical address, the geodetic location um, are, are gonna be the two prominent uh, types of um, data that's collected. Um, and there are special formats that, that are, that's collected in and we're gonna talk about that in a bit. So say a call is received by one of our originating service providers. Originating service provider is going to be your like voice over IP, your wireless provider, your landline provider. That 91 call is going to capture not only the voice, but it's going to now capture the location, whether it's a civic location or a geodetic location. And it's going to send that call to the emergency services routing proxy. The ESRP is the new selective router in your NG91 network the ESRP is going to query the emergency call routing function. The emergency call routing function is one of those components that will hold your GIS. And at the emergency call routing function, it is going to um, validate the location of your caller. It's gonna to try to you know, plot it against an address point or geocode against the road center line, or if it's a geodetic location, obviously it, it doesn't need that validation. And then it's going to query the PSAP polygon. Now, PSAP polygon for primary routing, law, fire, and EMS can support secondary routing, meaning that I'm gonna send the call, but the same GIS can be queried based on the caller's location to transfer those calls as well, which is why that GIS and the accuracy of the GIS is so important. So the ECRF is gonna say, okay, based on the, that location, I'm recommending this call go to PSAP A. It sends that information back to the ESRP. Now the ESRP, has uh, within it 
uh, a functional element called a policy routing function. And there are policy routing rules that are built in there. Um, a lot of these are basic policy routing rules we deal with today. Default routing, backup routing, overflow routing, those types of things. What do I do with it in these circumstances? But it's actually more, than more intelligent than how we do business today. It will also have, it, it allows time of day routing. So say uh, the GIS says this call goes to PSAP A, but based on a policy routing rule of time of day routing, PSAP A is closed from 2100 to 0700 and PSAP B um, answers calls during this time. The policy routing rule will say, okay, I know you're telling us PSAP A, but sorry, there's a rule here that says it's 2300 hours that PSAP's closed, let's send it to PSAP B. Um, it's much more intelligent than it used to be because the network can actually support that. And so then the call, so once all that's, once the information is received from the ECRF, they check the policy routing rules, there's nothing that prevents it from going to PSAP A. Again, that voice and that data is pushed along in the call and it's sent to the 91 Center where the now it's gonna engage the GIS in the 91 Center like it does today, which is why it's important that the GIS that supports the 91 network is also supporting the 911 Center at the time the calls received because we don't want conflicts between these two data sets if we can prevent that. Feels like I'm forgetting to mention something valuable. Now, the other thing that, uh, is important to understand in that NG91 replacement, when I said it replaces everything we do, it's replacing our voice analog network with a new IP voice data network. It's replacing uh, the MSAG in the alley with GIS instead for that call location validation and call routing. But we also have to replace the 91 equipment in the 91 centers. We have to replace it with equipment that can communicate in this new IP environment, but can also now consume all these new services that can happen because we have this improved network. Um, real-time text, real-time text. SMS to 91 works today, but it will work better in an NG91 environment. But for real-time text, for it to be true, real-time text to real-time text means you have to have an NG91 network and your call handling equipment has to be capable of supporting it. Uh, video, picture, alarms, automatic crash notification data, or not just the voice information that's sent to us. This network is going to be capable of so many more things, and our equipment in the 91 Center have to, has to be capable of doing that as well. Now, there are two places that really, that the GIS data, your GIS data is going to sit in the next generation I1 network. And it's called um, the location data validation function and the emergency call routing function. These are the two places that it's supported. Your GIS data actually will get into these two functional elements through what's called a spatial interface. The spatial interface is going to do a few things. It's going to take your GIS data, it's going to replicate it and put two exact copies in both of these functional elements. It needs it. The LVF is before I make a call, the ECRF is when I make a 911 call, and these data sets have to be exactly the same. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. I'm going to just uh, give you a brief description of both these functional elements. The spatial interface is also going to take your data and transform it to WGS84. So you don't have to support your data in WGS84. You can su support your data in your local projections, but know that once the spatial interface receives it, not only is it going to transform it to WGS84, but it's also going to take your data and transform it to the civic lo location data exchange format to support the LBF and the ECRF. Now, what will also happen at the spatial interface is some quality assurance checks will be performed. Um, the quality assurance checks are, are looking to see whether or not the data you're trying to provision, you're trying to give into the 91 system, is capable of supporting a 911 call. So it's not doing quality assurance checks like, hey, did I fat finger that address point and I put the wrong house number on it, or did I spell the street name wrong? It's looking for things like gaps and overlaps between your boundaries. It's looking for um, malfunctioned URIs. It's looking for um, data that's sitting outside of uh, provisioning boundary. The provisioning boundary is the boundary that says, it's like your geofence around your data that says, hey, I'm allowed to edit and I'm responsible for the data within this boundary. 
Um, if you try to provision data that's outside that boundary that could impact someone else's responsibility area, it would kick it back. It's some high level um, quality assurance checks, but not the type of quality assurance checks you need to do to ensure your data would even work or is even accurate for 911. Those are different, those are different types of validations. I'm going to pause a moment and see if there's any questions. I don't see any in the chat, but I wanted to pause. Okay, so the location validation function is one of two functional elements that your GIS will reside in within the 9-1 network. The location validation function is the new MSAG. So it will support your address points, your road center lines, your boundaries, um, the required data sets for NG911. It's gonna be there to validate locations and look for any type of errors before a 911 call ever happens. So this will be the place where your originating service providers will bounce their data up. This is where it would become MSAG valid. It now becomes LVF valid, if you will, as part of, uh, as part of the processing before the call ever happens. Oh, where'd my chat go? Must be hiding behind something. I think there was. Apologize. Um, Annie will find that for me if there was a question. Okay, it looks like we have one. When should we be shooting to transition our, our 91 data to NG91? What should be my timeline for transitioning data and starting to ensure all new data meets NG91 standards? That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad that you asked it. So I'm going to say now, and now for a couple reasons. Um, one, like Lance mentioned, there is currently uh, federal grants available. Um, it's my understanding based on the way the federal grant is set up, and this is not Lance's rules, these are the federal government rules. They're really needing you to apply for your grant with the state for you to obtain it and spend it and report it back by March, 2022. And most GIS projects are gonna take longer than a year because um, right now we're right at about a year, but they have to have all, all the uh, monies that are spent and reported back to the state 91 office in a timely manner to where they can now report it back to Congress, back to actually the uh, National 91 Program Office on how those, those funds were expended. And I, I believe the link to the grant was put out there. The second thing is, is um, GIS takes a long time to get ready. I mean, we think it's an easy lift for dispatch. I know for me, I was always like, hey, GIS person, this is super simple, right? And my GIS analysts have always been having to manage my expectations on what it actually takes to get this done. It, um, I, I, in our experience in Arizona, we had, um, at the time that we had decided that we were going to move to an NG91 network, meaning the ESINET, the call handling and the geospatial routing um, was in 2012. In 2012, we formed our 91 committee uh, from a GIS perspective and started to work towards uh, next generation 911. Now, um, I do want to say that at the time, uh, standards were still being finalized. Um, so we were learning as everyone else was learning. The value in us doing in getting started with that GIS conversation at the same time that we were trying to figure out what's our ESI not going to look like. Um, you know, what call handling equipment are we going to have? What are the capabilities of call handling equipment? Um, what does our geospatial routing platform look like? Because we started to talk about GIS, that impacted how we moved forward from a geospatial routing com component, the next generation core services. In Arizona, everything's very locally driven. And so what I needed the network to do, since I didn't have a statewide data set, is I needed to build the network in a way that would allow me to take all of these local pieces and make one giant state puzzle in the network. But it, had we not have gotten together and started to talk about how do we do GIS, we would have never known that this was one of those obstacles we may need to, to deal with. Um, the other thing we noticed was that uh, all the different ways that business was being done and that we had to be mindful about that. So as your public safety partners are worrying about their ESINET, most will deploy the ESINET first because they need to get away from this uh, voice analog network into something better so they can support, support better services. The second thing they're going to do is replace call handling equipment. Rightfully so. A lot of call handling equipment is super old. It, it's really on its last leg. I mean, 
uh, for IT folks, what, five years is way too long for you to have IT equipment. Most 9-1 centers, their equipment's much older than that. Um, so they're gonna focus their efforts on these first, which is good because that gives you time to do, uh, get your GIS ready for geospatial routing. But you gotta start at the same time they're thinking about it, which is now, which is why they're holding those classes. Because it's gonna take you uh, that amount of time to get your data up to date, to get your agreements in place, um, get the quality in into your data set and to educate everybody as to the path that you're going it really does take longer to get the gis ready than it is to uh, actually put out your rfp and get your providers probably more than you wanted me to share um, but I, it's a great question i'm super glad that you asked it so the emergency call routing function is an exact duplicate server of the location validation function except the emergency call routing function actually supports an active 9-1 call. So like I said, your data is gonna go through a spatial interface. The spatial interface is gonna to transform to WGS84. It's going to do some quality assurance checks and it's gonna move your data into the civic location data exchange format. Your GIS is then going to be replicated in the LVF and the ECRF. The LVF is there to support the pre-call validation process. The ECRF is there to say, okay, Yes, I recognize that that's part of my 911 system. This is how I route the call. And then even after it routes the call to the um, to the 911 center, that GIS can still be queried depending on how your network has been set up. That GIS can still be queried for additional routing. Um, that was our experience. Um, it was fantastic because as a caller moved and they moved from one fire district to another, we um, our the way our system was set up, it just did this dynamic routing. I mean, all I had to do was push a button and it was going to route it based on my GIS, um, not based on my interpretation of the GIS. Now that spatial um, point and polygon query is gonna be exactly like I just described. Either your call is gonna come in with a geodetic location of latitude and longitude, or it's gonna come in with a physical address, but then it's gonna look at the PSAP polygon to say, where do I route this call? And as long as there isn't a policy routing function um, that can impact the change in that routing, it's gonna be based off of your polygons. Um, you're not gonna know what the policy routing rules are, so you're just gonna build your polygons based on how routing should happen. And um, there is a process actually with the state on how to get PSAP boundary changes completed. And we're gonna, we're gonna go over that with you today so you're informed about it. But, Part of the discussion we had earlier was even like road centerline geocoding and how that may impact. So in this example, we have this theoretical range, 1308 plots very close to 1300. And based on how, um, what the road centerline's relationship is with the PSAP boundaries, the address point may route to PSAP A, but the actual geocoded road centerline would route, route to PSAP D. So we have to be very, uh, cognizant of not just what our address points are doing, but what our address point relationship to our road center lines are and what all these relationships are to all of our boundaries. Now you're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of different boundaries in next generation 911. Um, there are some required um, data that's needed. State and county is required for every data set. Um, even, even the attribution, the state and the county, um, has to have to be populated. And then you may have municipal boundaries, city boundaries is, is how uh, state of Oklahoma identifies this data layer. Um, you can have unincorporated, you could have neighborhood, there's tons and tons of different information out there. But then you're a PSAP, law, fire, and EMS. And while we're looking at address points and we're looking at road center lines and we're looking at that relationship that Annie was talking about, and then we're looking at the relationship of both of those to our boundaries, I really want you to think about when I overlay all these boundaries, is the answer still yes? Is it still correct for that point on the map as it's going through? Because a gap in a PSAP boundary means I don't know what to do with that call and all it can do is default route and that's not what we want. So a lot of times what will happen with your in your next generation core services network, which is where your GIS resides, um, there will be rules built around GIS based on the core service provider. Certain rules like they'll use uh, offsets, 
for road center lines. Um, an offset means that I'm going to, instead of the call plotting directly, geocoding directly on top of the center line, it's going to offset a little bit for more security in the PSAP boundary that for routing, especially in those jurisdictional boundaries, they may use uh, solutions um, like in the, as part of their quality assurance checks for the SI, minor gaps or slivers, they'll automatically correct by going to the closest boundary. This was a, a circumstance in the solution we used. We had to talk about that as a GIS community. Um, we, because we really didn't want a machine to machine interface making the decisions about our gaps and slivers. We wanted to look at our data, make sure there were no gaps and slivers. So we made a conscious thoughtful effort about what happened with that call. Because even, even a, a correction of snapping to the closest boundary could be the wrong way. And so we didn't want a machine making that decision for us. These are some of the discussions you may want to have, or even some of the questions you want to um, put forward to your NG core service provider um, when you decide to bring one on. There's a lot of other questions and a lot of standards out there, um, but these are just some of the things I'd like you to think about, especially you brilliant GIS folks who realize how GIS works um, and one of the, some of the challenges you may run into. Okay, so that was a whole lot of information about 911. I hope it was um, clear and concise um, and that you walked away with a better knowledge on how that works. Why don't we take, um, why don't we take a 10 minute break? And then Annie's actually gonna jump into the data model and the standard itself. Uh, 10 minute break, let's, it would be five after the hour. So if we can come back at what, 11.05? I keep trying to translate my time to central.
Charles? Sir, did you get up and? I'm actually typing right now. Oh, the, to the chat? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank we're, you, sir. We're, we're working on a response to the ODOT yeah. question. Because this is this is one of those ones that's been constant there, so yeah, I'm working on a I'm working on an answer on that one that's that's as current as we've got right now. So. Okay, I know that ODOT's participating in the toolkit, so yeah, there is I mean, that relationship there. But I wasn't uh, sure about the this question specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah give us a few minutes to figure out how to put this in real. Yeah, because this is one of those ones that I want to make sure it's the most current answer that we've we've actually worked with because this is a continual conversation that we've had back and forth. So I'm checking a couple of things. So I'll okay. Be well, we would rather the answer be right than quick. Exactly. So if it's something that you want to follow up with folks afterwards, that, that no, might no. work as well. No, I'll I'll have an answer in a few minutes. I'm just drafting, making sure I'm checking a couple of things, making sure that everything I'm saying right now is actually um current make sure there's nothing newer so i'll be right back Hey, you there, Sandy? Yep. Okay. Um, I typed that in there so it'll be in the record. But basically, the functionality, and I can I can mention that if anybody's listening, if they want to, um, so you can know where we're standing at it. Um, originally, when we did our first um, addressing standard, not even nine one one at nine one one standard, but addressing standard for Oklahoma. ODOT, um, I had some upper level discussions with ODOT and saw how their data was being used. And even though they are both street center line data sets, their, their purposes are so dramatically different that it, it changed what the geometry was of them because they would break them not at intersections, but they would break them at like functional road sections. So whenever they'd go from like asphalt to concrete, they were having breaks in the in the geometry that were messing up the geocoding you would have to change your geocoding and then whenever we had breaks like at um PSAP boundaries it was messing with our data so it would have been a busted up geometry um and years ago we didn't have linear referencing like we do now that's the last discussions that we've had was with linear referencing it might allow us to have 
a single data set, but we need to make sure that it's truly not going to break both different data sets. Does that make sense? Ab absolutely. So in Arizona, we had the same discussions because a lot of our counties who were submitting data to the um, Arizona DOT for the MAP 21 requirements, the Arnold requirements, um, were submitting data for 9 purposes one way, but then sending, submitting the same data set a different way for, uh, for the linear referencing system. And they really wanted just to be able to use the linear referencing system as, uh, as the geometry for the entire state, but the LRS didn't support all the attribution that they wanted. It didn't do the, the segment breaks that are required uh, for 911. And so it, there is an opportunity for those two relationships to happen it has to be very thoughtful and it has to be figured out still for most. They haven't yeah. quite figured out yet how to do both. And I think that Nina, this is, this is just personal, personal opinion on this one. I think Nina still got enough of a moving target on what the data set's going to be and all the different components of it, that that needs to be a little more, a little less volatile before we start to bring in another huge profession like DOT because we're already merging in GIS and 911. By the time we bring DOT in, this needs to be nailed down as far as, as exactly the way that things happen. With the exception of the transportation elements that are part of your road center line schema, which we're gonna highlight right, today. Right, Yeah. Yeah, and those, those exactly. are just some extra little bitty ones that are in there that are just some data sets. And one thing that I would mention, and I started to say it or, or type it in, with the legacy stuff, um, Legacy is probably where GIS folks are probably going to function and live because that's going to be the abbreviated. That's going to be probably what they're going to label off of. And in my data set, as I'm putting those extra fields in, I've actually got two different sets of geocoders. I've got next gen 911 geocoders and I've got legacy geocoders and they're pointing to the different field names because my legacies are abbreviated you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, i think that truly gis folks as far as labeling and everything they don't want to label on the the spelled out northwest they want to label off of nw right so it's not like they forget the legacy they're probably going to be labeling a lot off their legacy stuff and then the next gen is going to be in there for true next gen. So it's not right. like legacy doesn't need to be filled out. It, it truly does. And they don't realize a lot of them how much it truly does need to be filled out because that's going to be what they're going to be utilizing to be labeling everything off of. Well, and it's the granularity of the data that allows us to do more with it, to, yeah. be, to be honest. The more information and the granularity we have, then uh, the more ability we have to ETL into other solutions and support more business needs from a single data set. Yeah. Well, whenever I was, whenever I emailed you last night, I told Shelly earlier this morning, I said, you know, the cobbler's shoes are always the last ones to get fixed. <laughs> um, last night, I was absolutely in the process of taking my ESNs for the county, actually my, my, uh, my ESZ, making sure all the topology was right on it, busting up into my ESBs, um, having to take can make a the piece set bound. I mean, I, yeah, that was that was what I was working on all last night. So my actual ESN layer has every field possible that will ever be in the others all together. So whenever I merge them together, it's it's got every field that I need, and I can just delete it easier than I can add it. Exactly. Yeah, that's wonderful. So, but you're right. My, um, and then as a creator of the standard or one of the champions of the sh a standard, I guess I should qualify. It's uh, it's kind of embarrassing when you uh, when you have a standard out there, but your data's not in it, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I will say this. I did have ODOT whenever they ran. <laughs> I had Jeremy look at me and go, I'm, I'm, I'm just disappointed, Charles. And I'm like, oh, shut up, Jeremy. So I think he's pulling that one off. Day ever when somebody put Charles in his place going, I'm disappointed. I expected better from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's, oh my goodness, that is not what I said. But so Shelly, you and I will talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> yeah. I am perfectly fine with that. That is 
I have I have intentionally tried to keep the guy who who helped write the standard away from the guy who's having to do the implementation at the city of Ardmore, <laughs> because if those guys talk, nobody likes the discussions those guys have. <laughs> because I want, I want my data to be processed and utilize the exact same tools, and I still want. I mean, I don't want to have the same heartburn as everybody else, but. I want to I want to truly have a real assessment of how well it works. I don't want it to be a canned ivory tower. It just works. I'm going through right. the exact same thing everybody else is. Well, and and I always see. Um, I loved when I people would report errors to me. Uh, dispatchers, first responders, everyone that would report errors to me. They were looking at our data in a way that we couldn't have ran a tool to look at it. And um, I always. I mean, I. It sounds silly, but errors excite me. I, it, it allows me to make a better data set. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If I don't see errors in a data set, I probably haven't done my analysis correctly because I can promise you, you're going to find at least errors or you're going to find anomalies that you can explain, but they still pop up. There is no, there's no such thing as perfect in GIS. Um, if it is perfect, it means that you cleaned it up and you never touched it again. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that in itself is disappointing. And just to my credit, the, whenever whenever the thing lit up, Jeremy was like, I'm disappointed. It's because whenever we ran it, every cul-de-sac that I had in my town showed up as a dangling street because it just dead ended. So every cul-de-sac was what lit up in my town as an error. And I went back and went, oh, OK, they really weren't errors. But uh, well, you know. Well, that's why we call them anomalies, because exactly. um, sometimes even, even a parity concern, an address on the wrong side of the street, all those things. That's just what real life looks like. Um, and so you have to be able to exception those out and understand that it's not an error; that it, it's just the way life is. Okay, I'm looking so right now at the chat. Um, Yeah, that is an issue whenever you, you've got things being changed with the road center line. That's got to be communicated back to ODOT. Um, however, one of the things that I have, have discussed, and I don't know exactly how far this has gone, but I know with them having access to the 911 data set at the state level, that will be one of the things that they do look at and check back and forth with and and. I don't know if they're going to put something in that's a flag that shows changes, um, but they will have access to that data once it is uploaded to the repository. So it, their data set doesn't or have like a, a date update field or anything to indicate a, a change has happened? Got, it will have those. It'll have okay. the revision date on the, uh, the data sets whenever they get uploaded. Okay. Yeah, I know it will from in your standard, but does ODOTS? Um, I don't know. I haven't pulled their data in a while. Honestly, okay. I haven't. Okay, no worries. I didn't mean to put you on spot. I just didn't know. Because honestly, their data. Anyway. Yeah, honestly, their data, even though it will have its own data sets in there or attributes with it. Um, the originator of that data most of the time should be that local entity. Because it should be like whenever a subdivision comes in or something like that, that that a road could be built that ODOT wouldn't know about. And that should be whenever they do their uploads, that should have a time stamp that time and date stamp that, that shows that change was done. Otherwise, it should be a road that would be added by like ODOT and they're gonna know that one. Well, and I think what's gonna be, um, so Mr. Boyer, um, this conversation is important and I know Charles feels the same way and it's um, know that it's a conversation that he's having with the state 91 office and that it's not forgotten as an obstacle for, for rural Oklahoma. Um, no, I appreciate that. They, and, I'm the commissioner out here in Bryan County and I run into this constantly and I'm a GIS guy from way back and data is only as good as data in. And if we start ending yeah. up with mismatch or errors and no, no easy way to communicate these errors to the parties, we end up, it just continues to grow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's, that's all I'm out. 
Yeah. And, and this is a different presentation, so I won't go into my my um, my soapbox about it. But what you're talking about is a data supply chain, and that yes. data supply chain having the right communication and mechanisms in place to notify all relevant parties when when something happens. Um, and it can look like a lot of different things. And, and a lot of that is even building the relationships to know who should be notified. Um, the, uh, but I, I think we're gonna find is moving into next generation 911 that maybe how we've uh, done business in the past doesn't really support uh, the response needs that we have, whether from a data improvement uh, with that three business day turnaround um, or even from uh, gaining the right resources and making sure all the right people are in that information loop and that we're going to have to start thinking about what does our data supply chain look like and calling it that. Right. That is, that's actually what it is. Um, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing I will say, and I don't want to take up your time because I know we're fixing to jump on the topic here. Um, shoot me an email, Ron. Um, I'll give you that email address real quick in the chat. Um, right. email and I can can work with you and with ODOT and see if we can get some of that stuff cleaned up as well because I mean this is a constant thing that comes up a lot yeah. I know I've been discussing it with ODOT for the last 10 years yeah, and, and I work with Jeremy and his group all the time um, maybe I'm one of the few rural okay. areas that do but I'm familiar with their limitations they've got resource limitations it, it can say that it'd be nice to do it, but when it comes right down to implementing this, it gets to be messy because they're really, they don't, th this becomes a back burner issue if you're not careful. It does. Hopefully, and that, that's, that is truly one of the benefits that we, we have in Oklahoma. We got a lot of benefits because it's homegrown in here and we built it ourselves. We know, we know the strengths and the weaknesses, but with ODOT having been the ones who have developed the toolkit, um, they will have access to be able to take and look at that data whenever it gets uploaded to the to the state repository. And they're, I don't know, that may be a tool we need to look at ODOT and ask them if they want to see whenever things get uploaded to flag to let them look at changes. I, I would encourage that because I've done it manually with them and it doesn't always trip the trigger on whoever the resource is to manage you to, to change things. Okay. I mean, I don't know. That's that's a that's a real discussion item that whenever it gets uploaded to the state, that would be a good point in time for it to send a flag going, by the way, these are our changes. Yeah. That they could look at their their ODOT changes. That would a change that ODOT would be interested in. Yeah, yeah. That way through they could flag it through email or whatever, just some way to to get some communications going, because if you have to require on people manually pulling that information or going and looking. We've all got too much to do that we don't usually jump over and do invite extra work. We don't have to. Uh, amen. <laughs> all right. I appreciate your time. Well, let, let's get back to our real thing now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, it's all okay. good discussion. You, you got it, Miss Annie? I do. Can you hear me okay? I can. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm getting used to my new ear, ear pod things and don't seem to be fitting even with all the different little tips that are on there anyway um so the second module then is really introducing uh the gis data model and uh the oklahoma ng91 gis standard okay so the first thing that we need to understand is what is a standard well, not to be flip, um, but it's for standardization, right? So a standard essentially is a technical document that we're gonna use to reference um, for all of our GIS needs, especially as it relates to NG911. Okay, so it's gonna have best practices for developing data, um, using it, um, how it's gonna be used within different applications. And then it's also going to include, uh, obviously the recommendations and requirements are probably the biggest thing. So why do we care about a standard? I mean, what what is the big deal with, with having a standard? So again, a standard is for standardization. And when we start talking about aggregating data at the national level or even at the state level, um, it's important to understand that there are differences among data sets, okay? So a lot of us might have experience even, even within our own localities um, with diverse data sets. So think about um, maintaining road center lines for public works, works versus maintaining them for public safety. 
two very different business needs, two different um, two different data sets with possibly different attributes. Okay, and so it goes within a locality. You may have municipalities that are each their own addressing authority. So if you have five municipalities that are their own addressing authorities, plus you're the addressing authority for your county, there's uh, six different addressing systems right there. Um, we have one client in California, they have a municipality that's, that's using three different addressing systems in one municipality. Okay, so it, it's, it, it brings standardization to the data and it establishes what the minimal requirements are. It says, look, you know, you, you guys have all of this, um, but this is what we need. This is the bare minimum. Okay, um, and it's important to remember that because NG91 relies on GIS data for emergency call routing, it absolutely has to adhere to the standard. Now, I, I mentioned this earlier, and we've kind of had this discussion ongoing about legacy data, and I want to make sure that you guys understand, again, the state is not telling you, hey, you have to change how you're maintaining at the local level. Okay, because you're still going to need to maintain your GIS to support all of your different business needs. Okay, they're just saying, look, for NG91, these are the fields that are required. This is what you have to submit as far as the layers and the fields. All right. Okay, so with regard to the Oklahoma standard, what that does is it basically defines the application and usage associated with NG91. Okay, it tells you, um, hey, this is this is what the data is going to be used for, and then it also provides guidelines um, as far as an addressing standard is concerned. So if you're still struggling with addressing in your locality, or you know you're you're thinking about your addressing, there are some really good uh, best practices and things to consider within the standard. Okay, it also identifies those components that are required for routing calls for NG911. All right, and it's important to note here that the Oklahoma standard effectively supports the national standard. Okay, so there's national standards and then there's the Oklahoma standard. Okay, and that actually exceeds the national standard because it does include additional um, attributes that you can maintain within that data, especially regarding like storm shelters and transportation. Okay, so the standard outlines the required layers for NG911, and we did talk about those earlier. Okay, that would be the address points, the road center lines, and all of the associated emergency um, boundaries that you're going to need. And then it also tells us how are we going to represent that. Okay, so obviously we want to use lines to represent streets. We want to use polygons to represent our um, ESDs. Okay, and then it also outlines the schema. Okay, so remember we said earlier that the schema is essentially defining the structure of those attributes. Okay, it's telling us, hey, this data needs the following attributes, and this is how this is how they should be stored. Okay, so for example, um, an address number should be a number and not an alphanumeric. Okay, and it's also going to tell us which fields are mandatory, conditional, optional, and those that are for transportation. Okay. So a little bit of background about the standard. Um, in 1994, the state GIS council was formed. Um, and then in 2004, the name changed to the um, Office of Geographic Information. All right. Um, in 2011, um, a work group was formed with the goal to research, uh, develop, and submit an addressing standard for adoption by the GIS Council. All right, so the focus was to research what address standards are being used in Oklahoma and develop a custom set of addressing standards that would adhere to the current industry or national standards. All right, um, so the standard was developed under the authority and guidance of the GI Council, the Oklahoma Office of Geographic Information and volunteers within the GIS community. Um, and we could go to the next slide. So the legislative duties, um, really the GI Council oversees the OGI and they actually will um, be involved as far as development adoption and recommendation of the standards. And then the OGI really is responsible for development, maintenance, and updating the uh, GIS standards under the direction of the council, but then they are also working with the state and local agencies. And I didn't know if anyone from the state wanted to 
uh, chime in here as far as um, the state role in this, um, if there's anything more that needs to be said. I'll let Shelly jump in on that one. Well, um, Charles is actually on the council. He is the um, city liaison for the council. Um, so if you have any specific questions, Charles can also answer that. Um, Shelly will be, the, in case you guys don't recognize my voice. Um, I am the assistant state GI coordinator. I work with the Office of Geographic Information. And really our goal and our job with the Office of Geographic Information is just to help the state and people of Oklahoma with any geographic information needs you have. So at any point, if you have any questions or if you're looking for something, certainly feel free to reach out to myself or to Charles. Um, this is one of our big initiatives with the address standards, working with NextGen 911, working with the 911 management authority to coordinate this effort. So if there's anything you need, we can certainly point you in a direction. I tell people a lot of times I may not be able to answer your question, but I can certainly point you in a direction to get you the answer that you need, hopefully. So um, the one thing is with the Office of Geographic Information is we are an unfunded agency. So um, we work with everything, kind of like the council, everything is unfunded. So we do a lot of it in our spare time um, trying to get all this stuff coordinated and done. But hopefully we can we can get you what you need. I'll have Charles put my uh, my contact information in the chat as well so that you can reach out to me um, if you need anything. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. One other, okay, thing, that so, one other thing that I'll toss in there real quick, sorry. One other thing I'll toss in there real quick, and it, you're probably fixing to touch on it, but between the Management Authority and the GI Council, there is a constant work group that works hand in hand that is truly 50-50 on both sides of that. Um, and we meet um, weekly, and then I would say more than weekly on special projects. So we're completely, I see people, I talk to people in this group more than I do people in my own office. Thank you. Okay. So what is the standard for? I mean, we've really just touched on this in uh, previous slides, but essentially um, the standard is going to be your master document for all things NG911 standards and addressing. Okay, so think of the guide as, um, you know, the, the master guide for which you will reference any of those things. Okay, um, it establishes the guidelines for developing and maintaining those 911 data sets. And it, again, will also outline the, uh, the structure um, and as well as provide uh, structure for the tabular data and the attribute data. Okay, because um, next gen on one is going to consume tabular data and it's also going to consume the geographic data with attributes. Okay, and the use is for both public and private sector. So who should use the standard? I mean, pretty much everyone, <laughs> right? So um, the approved agencies are defined in the standard as an organization approved by the state of Oklahoma NG91 or 911 coordinator to edit and or submit NG91 data to the state repository, okay? Um, the table of approved agencies and their IDs and corresponding discrepancy agency will be maintained by the state 911 coordinator. All right, so the approved agencies are going to be uh, your PSAPs, your COGS, and your vendors. All right, now the agency ID is assigned by the state coordinator. All right, the ID is unique for each agency and it's utilized within all of the related tools and documentation to reference an agency. Um, and we'll talk about this here in a few minutes that the agency and the discrepancy agency ID are, are included as required fields in all of your NG911 data sets. Okay, so let's go ahead to the next slide so we can talk about the discrepancy agency. So in the past, uh, the discrepancy agency has also been known as um, the authoritative agency or the provisioning agency, steward, jurisdiction. There have been lots of names for the discrepancy agency, but they are the agency that has two very important roles. Number one, they're the ones who officially submit the data to the repository. And number two, they receive a discrepancy report back 
and they are responsible for overseeing that that data is corrected. Okay, so before the data is actually provisioned into the ESINet, which Sandy touched on earlier, um, it does need to go through a set of checks and validations before it's provisioned. Okay, and what happens is if there's any issues within that data, if you find any anomalies, um, that is going to be generated on a report and sent back to the discrepancy agency. And they are the ones who are responsible for ensuring that the data is corrected. Okay. So the thing about the discrepancy agency is that um, they can submit data on behalf of another agency, but you have to work with the 911 coordinator. All right. Um, they may correct the data if they are the agency that locally maintains the data. All right, so it's it's very simple. They they are kind of like the boss for uh, submitting the data and making sure that any anomalies are resolved um, at the local level uh, and get pushed back up to the state. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so the idea of data stewardship um, really, again, it's it's thinking outside of our our own individual localities. OK, um, we need to make sure that we're working with not only the state, but also our neighbors. OK, so every agency has to work in conjunction to resolve conflicts. All right. And oftentimes there is more than one solution to a problem. So, you know, it, you can't go in with a mindset of this is the only way it can be done. OK, and I think the state can can help facilitate that conversation, especially they're going to have to if it pertains to boundaries. But the ultimate goal is to have. Um, a seamless interoperability between the data sets. We talked earlier about coordinate system and the role that it has in making sure that the data is, is all matching geographically. Okay, that's, that's one aspect of the seamless um, interoperability. Okay, you have to have that stewardship there as well. All right. Okay, so um, one example, a personal example, Sandy's included here um, uh, an example, but I have um, some examples from the, the work that we've done with our clients. Oftentimes, um, I'm called in to facilitate boundary discussions, um, and what this involves is conversations between PSAPs um, and their GIS staff. Okay, as GIS people, we don't care where you want your boundary. Just tell us where to draw the line, right? We, that's all we care about. Where do you want it? Um, but there is a bigger discussion that has to go on, um, especially if you have overlaps, if you have gaps, if you have roads that cross jurisdictions. These are very important topics that you'll want to discuss. Okay, and so often we come in together, we discuss these, um, we discuss potential resolution, and then um, we ultimately will document the decision so that the client has a record of what they're actually doing um, to resolve that anomaly. And Sandy, I didn't know if you wanted to give some color to your example that you've included here. Actually, this is ex this is the exact example that came from the standard. So it, this was not my personal example. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I love the fact yeah. that you think I'm smart enough to have an example this complex. <laughs> honestly, this one, honestly, this one came directly from Mike Davis about Oklahoma City. This language 100% was Mike Davis. <laughs> well, that explains why uh, it's so brilliant, right? It was Mike. So yeah. his words are still all throughout this thing. Okay. So when we talk about data stewardship um, and the idea of maintaining our boundaries and, and what that looks like, especially with state involvement, um, there's, there's guidance out there, okay? And I think uh, Sandy included that in the email that went out along with the standard. Um, essentially, there are guidelines for the maintenance of municipal boundaries uh, and GIS files, okay? Uh, so we know that, that sometimes there are annexations and there are de-annexations that can occur or you need to make corrections to your existing municipal boundaries. And the document provides some guidance there about how to accomplish that. Okay, so what the document does is it defines the rules for the annexations and the de-annexations. It also defines the process um, for the necessary changes um, for next gen 911 purposes, uh, because as you move your municipal boundaries, your 911 boundaries are also probably going to change. Um, and it does give um, indication that the changes have to be approved and endorsed. 
Okay. And so if you need to make a change to your 911 boundaries, um, you do have to complete a PSAT boundary change request. Okay. And uh, the document that we've linked to also defines the process for the requested changes, um, including a detailed explanation of the change, uh, a letter from the neighboring PSAPs that are impacted by the change, and then a shape file. All right. And then, of course, you would be asked to provide any supporting documentation. So um, a map from the tax commission, um, any error correction or jurisdictional agreements. So after after the uh, review and approval, um, the information is delivered to the OGI who makes the necessary changes and <clears throat> excuse me. And then the 911 coordinator's office notifies each of the PSAPs um, that the final change has been made. Um, in addition to this data or these documents, there's also the pamphlet that was provided to you by the tax commission. And does anybody have any comments about that? I guess the only okay. comment I want to offer is that um, it, it appears that the municipal boundary uh, guidelines have been around for annexations and the annexations for, for quite some time. But there were some, um, an extra process put in place for NG91 purposes to that municipal boundary guideline. Um, and then as well, the 91 PSAP boundary change request since that boundary is managed at the state level. And Charles is going to jump in here if I, if I expressed anything incorrectly, but that was my understanding of reading the guidelines. No, you're pretty straight on that one. And matter of fact, I called and contacted the tax commission yesterday just to double check, see if there's anything new. And the only thing that I would tell anybody out there who's listening about municipalities and annexations and de-annexations, read through that Appendix A because it's got dates that do matter. You might look for a, a record, say, from an annexation for back in the 1960s and look at the county and you may never find it because it may never have had to been filed to be legally effective at that point in time. Um, this Appendix A will actually give you those dates to let you know where to look to make it a legally effective annexation. Um, those are some things that really weren't defined until the last couple of years. Um, and as city limits become to where they matter between all the annexations and all the uh, PSAP boundary changes, uh, if you're looking for documentation, this will let you know where to look and how far to look. Because sometimes you can be looking forever for something that doesn't exist. Oh, that's really good to know. Yeah, that's great I, information. And I don't even live in Oklahoma, and I know that's good info. The other thing I would say is we're currently working right now with with uh, tax commission um, to see if we can submit BAS, the boundary annexation, with the Census Bureau. Um, I don't think it's going to be functional this year, but um, we're trying to get it like Arkansas has theirs to where um, we submit ours to the tax commission, and the tax commission submits the entire state of Oklahoma's at one shot makes it a little bit easier on the local entities. So not there yet, but we're still working on it. Great, thank you. So continuing our discussion about data stewardship, um, the important takeaways here is that uh, the, the local agency is responsible, okay? You're responsible for ensuring that your data is maintained to the standard and submitted to the state repository. Okay, and submission is done either by working directly with the state repository, so you can submit it yourself, or if you enter into an agreement for someone else to be your um, discrepancy agency, which would allow the data to be maintained on your behalf by that agency. And Annie, their and then, future course is actually going to cover um, how to do those submissions through the portal. Yep, thank you. I was just getting ready to say that. That's oh, I'm great. Sorry, dear. No, um, you're I, fine. I was going to mention we already, uh, for some reason, there's already a break in, but I'm thinking we should go ahead and move through it. I'm okay with that if you guys are. Okay. Yeah, because we just started shortly after the hour. Okay. So, module three is bringing us to the standard and requirements. Okay. Now, we've heard a lot of information here. Excuse me, just a Sorry, I'm also suffering from allergies here in Virginia. So um, I've been just sneezing and coughing all day. Um, so anyway, the module three is, is really touching on what the standard says the data needs to look like, okay, as far as 
the requirements, the schema, um, the fields that are going to be maintained, et cetera. And it looks like we did have, it looks like we did have a question in the chat. Are the PSAPs going to pull all data from the state data instead of us submitting it elsewhere? Um, can you expand on, are the PSAPs going to pull all data from the state data? Submit my data to vendors for inclusion. Oh, I understand. Okay. So, so what you're saying is, so you're saying that you, you, um, send your shape files or, or whatever to a vendor who actually updates your public safety systems. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes. And if there's a requirement now to give all this data that, to the state repository, it would make sense that it's just a one shop place to put data or is it just gonna be another place I need to provide another copy of my data? I would say that, um, it, yes, you're gonna have to provide that data. Um, you know, in the future though, different vendors uh, may have different requirements as far as how to submit that data. So. Um, I know that a lot of different public safety systems uh, require a lot of effort to update. So that is still something I think that people are gonna have to work out at the local level. What do you think, Sandy? So I know I, the, the goal is from the state perspective is that uh, the data set support engine I one would be fed up to the state. Um, they currently support the PSAP boundary. So if you have a vendor that is uh, currently supporting your PSAP boundary file, you may want to take a look at what the state has and uh, compare what you have or what you understand as your PSAP boundary and what they are. And then uh, if there's any questions then initiate that, that request process. And, and so your PSAP data, I'm, I'm, are you talking about every data set or just the, the PSAP boundary data set? Sir? No, no, I, I provide you know, everything they get from me, my address points, my center okay. lines, my driveways, my everything, the PSAP boundary I handle with the state. I understand that part. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to say under this, it looks to me, if I understood what you said, that I'm also now going to be providing all my data to the state somewhere in a certain format. That's what I'm, and so therefore, why, why wouldn't the PSAP feed from there? And that way we make one, <coughs> one set of the data rather than different dates on my data going to different vendors to feed the PSAP machines, the actual what they use down there, right? This is Shelly and we are building the repository at this point and that we're, we're putting into place those processes of how that will be, your data will be submitted to the state. One of the ways we're going to allow that to happen or at least at this point is the vendor can submit it for you if you want them to. All so right. we put it to whether you can do it or uh, the, the um, vendors will do it. And then we will just, we will be a repository for that. So our, the data that you submit to us will be whenever you make changes. So if you want to get the data back from us or, you know, we're really looking at the locals as being the most up-to-date data. Right. So whenever you make changes, either you or the vendor, whoever you're using, will then submit the data to us. Does that make sense? All right, sense? thank you. Yeah, that, that, it's just, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and if you, if, if you have any questions, my email's in there. We can talk yeah. about that. Um, in, in course B3, um, they, they talked about this a little bit. Course B3 will really get into that. <laughs> About the repository, how you'll run the validation tools, and how you will submit that data up to the state. Yeah, I, I just the train. This is wonderful, and I'm learning more about my job than I know, even though I've been doing it for a year. <laughs> but you'll be hearing, you'll be hearing from me for sure. I've already written down your name and number. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Contact me at any time. Thank you. And. And please, for everyone on the call um, or on the in the class today, these types of so the question that was brought forward, 
Um, this should be a question everybody should be asking themselves. And it's um, and as the classes roll out, a better understanding will happen. And then uh, how to apply that to your workflow will come more easily to you. Um, we realize right now that we're throwing some information out there and there's still some unknowns. Um, but I um, rest assured by the time you make it through all three classes, we feel you're going to be more confident in your understanding of how things are going to work in the state and um, can help support you in figuring out how you fit into that, that, I hate to use the term cog, because I know cog means something specific, but into that larger dynamic. Thank you guys for the discussion. Okay, so now we're gonna move into understanding uh, what the standards are and what it requires of us, okay? So um, the first thing we need to discuss is the field requirements. So earlier when we had our little GIS demo, we were looking at um, the attributes for address points and road center lines. Remember that we saw that you know the address points had um, had been broken out into um, individual elements for that address. Um, the road center lines had uh, their road name present as well as um, ranges. So those are different types of attributes. Okay, for the data. And really, the standard mandates which fields are going to be mandatory, conditional, or optional. And when we look at the standard here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to see that's made very clear for you, um, and it's spelled out in the standard. Okay, so mandatory. Mandatory means that it's mandatory. It's absolutely required. You must populate this field. Okay, so one example would be uh, the county field. Okay, so those are the minimum fields that must be populated. Those are the ones that are mandatory. Okay, ones that are marked C mean conditional. Okay, that means if you have an attribute for it, it must be populated. Okay, if you don't have it, then you just leave it blank. So, for example, some people uh, may have pre directionals for their streets, some people may not. If you have it, then populate it, okay? It's the same with uh, sub addressing. Um, if you don't have it, then leave it blank. Make sure the fields are there, all right? So the optional fields, the optional ones have to be present, but they may or may not be populated, okay? Now, earlier we mentioned um, the transportation fields, and this is something that is uh, different. Um, as far as when you compare the Oklahoma standard to like the national standard, they do include uh, these transportation fields. These are not mandatory fields, okay, but they have to be present in the data, all right? And the transportation fields specifically pertain to transportation and routing functionality, okay? So, for example, um, speed limit may have a value such as 25. Um, if, it's, if it's populated, in your data, in your maintenance schema, how you're maintaining data today, then just move, move that number into the speed limit field, okay? If you don't, then just set the default at 21, all right? So that's kind of an overview of, um, of the requirements as far as the attributes are concerned. Field types refer to how the data is stored, the format that data is stored in, in each uh, column, okay, if you're looking at it in terms of a database, um, what, what does it mean for a field to be alphanumeric or date time or numeric or decimal, okay? All of these things have a role, and in a few minutes, Sandy is going to explain um, why we have to manage our GIS data a specific way, but for now, um, a field type basically just defines the format that the data is stored in. All right, so alphanumeric is a combination of letters, numbers, or characters. Uh, date time is in a date and time format. Um, numeric is whole numbers, also known as integers. And decimals, also known as doubles, would be whole numbers that have decimals associated with them. All right, and the standard, again, will outline what that type needs to be. Now, as we're going through and we're looking at the standards um, for each of the required data layers, you're going to notice that these three fields in particular are at the very top of every single uh, schema that's defining the uh, layer in the standard. Okay, so every single layer is going to require these three fields. 
Okay, the NGU ID is called the NINA Globally Unique ID. All right, and what that is, is it's a unique identifier for every feature record in the GIS. Okay, not, not every street. Okay, you might have Miller Street that's got 25 segments. It's not one number for the entire street. It's gonna be 25 individual unique IDs. Okay, it is required for all of the databases and it has a very specific purpose, okay? And you're like, my gosh, why do we have to have a unique ID for, for every single street segment if it's the same street name? Well, here's why. Because again, going back to the idea of um, this being a nationwide system, so if my PSAP fails, then one that's two states away should be able to route my calls. Um, what it does is it says to the spatial interface, this particular ID of this street name okay, um, in this PSAP is responsible for correcting that error, all right? So in other words, if you have a road center line, like in our example, we have a road center line. The ID that you've assigned to it is 24965, okay? And just say you're in Washington County. I don't know if that's a county, but um, think about how many Washington counties we have all throughout the United States. This is saying that PSAP.Washington.Oklahoma.gov is the responsible agency for that discrepancy. Okay, so it all goes back to that discrepancy reporting. All right, we want to make sure that we're getting the discrepancies to the right agency. And because we have so many Washington counties, so many Frederick counties, um, so many counties of the same name all across the United States, we have to have some way to differentiate that. Okay. Um, the agency ID and the discrepancy agency ID are also going to be required fields. And remember that the discrepancy agency ID is the agency that receives that report. So they're going to receive the report that's going to have that NGU ID on it associated with any anomalies that stem from that validation before the data is provisioned into the ESINET. Okay, so in the standard that we're going to look at in just a second, um, you're going to notice that the schemas are provided for the address points, the road center lines, the ESDs, uh, the PSAP, um, the discrepancy agency boundary, and then for the individual service boundaries for fire law and EMS. Okay, and um, again, we have provided the links at the bottom of our slide, so you guys can just click on that and go right to the standard. Um, but yeah, if you, let's see, what's our next slide? Oh yeah, domains. Let's take a look at this real quick. So here's another reason why I want you all to start considering uh, maintaining your data in a geodatabase format, because you get to leverage subtypes and domains, okay? Um, so the state standard allows you to have domains and they do provide a domain table within the schema, or I'm sorry, within the standard. And what domains do is they actually give you a pick list. Okay, so instead of typing out your county uh, 50 times when you have a subdivision that's going in, you can just click a drop down, and it makes it so simple. So again, it's facilitating that standardization of all the data across your, your data sets, and it also reduces the introduction of error, okay, because you're not having to sit there and type it in multiple times. So domains are, are really useful. And again, when we talk about the toolkit and B2, the toolkit is going to um, help you with those domains. Okay, so we'll go through that in the second class. So don't forget to sign up for that when it becomes available. Okay, so address points. Um, address points are required um, and they are maintained at the local level and submitted to the state. Okay, so you are responsible for maintaining these at your local level. Okay, that's creation, maintenance, and submission. Again, unless you have uh, contracted with another agency to handle that for you. Okay, and the thing about address points, if we go to our next slide, is that currently, you know, depending on your state of readiness um, or depending on, you know, what data you're currently maintaining, addresses can exist in, in several formats. Okay, so you might have an address in a database. Um, like many municipalities with whom we work, they have um, 
they have a, an Excel database with all of their addresses. They don't have a GIS, but they've got maybe a record of their addresses in a database. Okay, it can also be um, spatially associated. So you may have um, addresses that are associated with points, which is great. Um, you also may have address ranges that are associated with your street center line. So those are just some of the different ways that you can find um, address points. Um, but the, the important thing to remember here is that the standard is telling you, you need to have an individual address point for your structures and the data must be structured a certain way so that it meets the standard. Annie, were you gonna, before we move on to how address exchange works in, in G911, did you wanna bring up the um, address schema yeah. for viewing? Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and review that one. You want me to do it here? Or you want me to share it? With yeah, you? if you don't mind. Okay. Let me see. Um, I think I already have it here. Are you actually seeing the standard now? Or are you still mm -hmm. seeing the PowerPoint? Fantastic. I see the standard. So I think it's page 14 ish is where we go. the address points start. Okay. So if you scroll up just a hair, I want you guys to notice the, the paragraph right above where the schema starts. So at the very last sentence, it says, this data set is to be maintained at the local agency level and submitted to the state repository. So the schema is very thorough, or the standard is very thorough about um, how this data is to be created, maintained, and then submitted. All right, so um, taking what we just talked about, I want you to notice that the schema for the address points, and by the way, it's, it's laid out the same, right? So you have the field name, uh, the description, the field type, and then it's gonna give you the width, um, whether or not it's mandatory, conditional, optional, or transportation, and then it's gonna refer you to the domain table if one exists. But the field name is on the left, okay? And that's, that's what the field name is supposed to be in the data. Now I wanna draw your attention to the top three fields because those are the ones that we just talked about that are mandatory. You see that M next to all three of those? Those are mandatory fields that are required of each data layer, all right? And we noticed here, okay, the discrepancy agency ID is the agency that receives the discrepancy report. Okay, so it's telling us the purpose of the field. Then it's telling us that that field type must be alphanumeric because it needs to be able to accommodate numbers and letters and special characters potentially. Okay, the field width when we set up our database needs to be at least 75 characters long, and we know that it is a mandatory field. So Annie, if, now, if, if my field width, if my is actually beyond 75, what's the implications of that? The implication is that the data may not be stored within that field. You may, you may have, um, have an issue populating that field if the if the width is not if if it's too small or if it's too big it may cause some issues um, and this is where we're going to um, really leverage the toolkit once we're ready for that the toolkit is going to help with all of this okay um, I don't want to give any spoilers but the toolkit essentially will set this up for you um, so if you don't have any um, GIS data at all you can actually check a button and it's going to create those layers for you, just the shell, okay? But that's a lot because these schemas are very extensive. So it's going to create the shell of the schema and you can just go right in and start editing. All right. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we do wanna pay attention to this, but again, I don't want you guys to feel so completely overwhelmed and stressed out because help is coming. Um, I, I definitely don't want you to go through an exercise of, okay, now I have to create a brand new feature class. Um, and now I have to create these fields and I have to pay attention to all of these field widths because the state has developed a tool to help you with that. All right. Oh, perfect. Um, and so, yes, the domain, the domain tables are extremely helpful and where you see um, a domain table in the data there to the far right, that means that it associates that particular field with a domain. Okay, so it could be a yes, no, um, it could be, uh, gosh, it could be um, an identifier. There's, there's lots of different domains within the standard that can help define the data. And again, that's part of the toolkit as well. There, is, a, there is an area, I'm sorry. 
I didn't. I'm sorry. I did you want me to jump to the domain tables? I apologize. I didn't mean to. Yeah, we can do that. That's fine. Yeah. So these are the domain tables. So um, so these are the agency ID domains. Okay. And again, this is going to show up as a pick list in your data. Once you've prepped your data, this is going to be a pick list because that's what the domain does. Okay. Um, if we keep scrolling down, I think there was, yeah, there's lots of different, there's lots of different domains, um, storm shelter, and they're all associated with these different fields. Okay. So, um, for example, when you go to edit data regarding a storm shelter, when you click the pick list, it's going to give you those four options, above ground, above ground outside, above ground in the structure, or below ground in the structure, below ground outside, et cetera. Does that make sense? I hope, I hope that makes sense. You'll see it a little bit better in our next class, but, but it, the, the standard is really good in that it does tell you, hey, a domain exists for this. And I have to, so the placement um, is also um, very important. Um, it's, and not just from a developing GIS point of view, but um, for our 911 centers, I'd like to encourage you to maybe uh, have that as one of the fields that you display in your mapping solution. Uh, where an address point is placed is going to be valuable to us knowing from a response point of view what that means, what that address point means in our map, meaning is it is it the centroid of the parcel? Is it actually sitting at the property access, meaning that, hey, this is the driveway? Is it sitting on the structure itself, right? So that could help us in understanding what that point means to us if we don't have other information, uh, like a parcel boundary or something like that, to, or aerials to help us distinguish in our mapping. I, I think that uh, from a dispatch point of view, we overlook the value in this placement method. Okay. So before we, um, was there anything else about the standard you wanted to look at for address points at this point? No, I, I think I do want to say though that, you know, because I'm I'm a GIS person, you know, and I insisted on these next couple of slides, um, <laughs> but I always like to tell people why, uh, why you have to maintain data a certain way, not just because it, it does this. Um, I think it's really good to have a full understanding of, of how that data is being used in the call routing process, because many of you may look at this a schema and say, gosh, you know, I already maintain this data. Why, what do you need me to do this for? What do you need me to go through this effort for? And the important thing is to understand that there is a rhyme and reason, and Sandy's getting ready to explain it, um, about how that GIS data works in the call routing process. And we're not going to get like super into the weeds, but I think it's going to give, especially for the GIS people, it's going to give a little bit of better perspective about why we need to um, start moving our fields around, why we need to parse out our address, uh, why we need to maintain certain fields in a particular format. So Sandy, okay. I'll let you and before we do that, why don't we take a quick 10 minute break? So if we can come back at 12 after the hour, um, since we skipped our last break, that'll allow everybody to maybe grab some food since it's lunchtime. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up our session. Hey, Sandy, are you there? Yes, sir. One thing that I, I'll toss to you that um, I think we've probably already said before, but um, I know we said it early on, if someone has a GIS that's functional in, in dispatch, really if they just clean their data up and start migrating that direction and add the extra fields, um, it's not there to change what they're doing. It just enhances it a lot. Um, because really if they've got an existing one that's functional and clean it up, they're going to be really close to having it functional with next gen. The toolkit will do, do a lot of the rest of the next steps for them. Yeah, it, it, for sure. Exactly. And the only, I mean, there may be, um, you know, breaking road segments at additional places they hadn't broken before. Yeah. Um, you're right at adding the additional fields and then um, doing those attribution to attribution and then topology checks. Yeah. Um, and attribution. One thing that our address standard. One thing that our address standard honestly did not get into 
Um, and I've had several people ask about it. The one thing it did not get into intentionally did not get into was the methodology. Like whenever you look at the, like the, um, oh, the planning uh, association of like um, national standards of how you address cul-de-sacs, how you address certain things. Yeah. It, we intentionally didn't do that because Oklahoma's has come online one piece at a time. And the intent was not to change everyone's format of how they address because if you have the mapping done correctly, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, I've, I've learned that where we're at, we actually, in our city, we run quadrants, uh, but whenever you look at the county, we're right in the middle of the county, and they start at one corner and, and grow up both directions. We have two different systems that are in the same dispatch and the same data set. As long as you maintain your own data correctly, it's not an issue. I mean, if you do it by a certain couple of standards, you can address however you want to, as long as you adhere to those fundamentals. So. Well, and the and in addition to that, um, and I'll bring up the document as we talk, um, because I really want folks to feel like there are resources to help them out. Um, not only is, um, so Charles, I think you know that I co-chair the NINA Working Group for GIS Data Stewardship for NG91. So the PSAT yep. boundary documents out there, the Road Centerline Working Group is wrapping up their, rec their, um, you know, their best practices, so is service boundaries. And the reason that these information documents are being produced is because we have standards out there, but we also understand these standards need thoughtful interpretation to apply your local needs. And not only from a, hey, I have uh, this problem, this is what I run into, whether or not do I use stacked or do I, what, how do I support this? How do I support my overpasses? How do I support elevation? How do I, how do I, how do I? Um, and I needing to have the discussion, the information documents are there. But part of what we're gonna talk about next is um, the civic location data exchange format and how that has examples from across the nation of how you can apply um, information to every one of these fields. So folks aren't mm -hmm. feeling like they're floundering trying to figure it out. So if it's not in the Oklahoma standard, then know that there's other documents out there that can help point you in the right direction as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the things that, that Mike and I had gone over with. And there was a statement that came out of us trying to figure out how to take and make it bulletproof. And we finally had to step back and, and concede to one, one piece of functionality. Educate, you can't legislate. You can educate people on the correct way to do it, but you cannot mandate it because they can always break it. It can, oh, break, yeah. you can always find an anomaly. You can't. You can always write into the into the standard pages and pages for every possible anomaly, and I promise you, you're going to miss them. Go for exactly the the core functionality of what's required. Keep it simple, and the rest of itself, you educate people with proper methods, and it works itself out. It really does. And as long as the mandatory fields exist and they're populated where they must be populated ng91 works yeah so and and oklahoma seems to be tackling this the same way we did in arizona i i've joked about this before i i, I mean i i uh, adhere to the standards i mean i'll i'll lick the side of the glass but i don't necessarily drink the kool-aid because i knew that in my community we had special needs and mm -hmm. and you've built those into your standard um, so you, that's where uh, Annie had said, um, you know, that you would you uh, adopt the national standards that are needed for NG91 to work, but you've improved upon them in order to support Oklahoma more, more holistically. So, yeah, absolutely. And I that's why we're going to include that discussion on, hey, there are resources out there. And I'll even follow up after the training with where these resources can be found so folks aren't feeling like they're floundering about it. Although we have tried as best we can in the PowerPoint to make sure that if we're referencing a document, the link is at the bottom of the page. So when they receive nice. the PowerPoint, they can go directly to it. Um, just like in this one on the data formats, we made sure section 205 where this information came from is identified right there. Now it just takes you to the document, but you know to go look for that section, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So yep. we wanted it to be an easy button for sure because NG91 as a whole is overwhelming. I've got a stack in my office that's probably 18 inches to two feet tall of all of the standards that it's pulled from. And actually I daisy chained those things together with, with references on 
okay, this document references this one, this one references this one. Um, what you will find if you do that is at some point in time, it becomes a circle and some documents reference another document. And when you, when you truly follow it through, there were circular references in a lot of those things, especially whenever they would do it with other states. That's why whenever we look into ours, we actually jumped out and looked at different states completely that were off the radar. Because if you're careful, you could get you could get a uh, professional inbreeding almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's weird how it's like, oh, that was, you know, A reference B, B reference C, C reference A. Wait a second, now that doesn't work. Well, and, and Annie teases that she's a GIS geek, but I'm a standards geek and I, I have the same thing, but it's all IETF standards. I've been reading the NINA I3 standard line by line. I have 20 pages of notes and I'm only a third of the way through the document. And That's then I a miserable have a huge, read, by the way. It is miserable. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, but then I, I also have a stack of the all the IETF standards, which inform uh, the I3 standard. So, so here's a question I've got for you. Hmm. I've got a running list of everything whenever it says we adhere to these standards. And then when you look at those standards, those standards don't agree. Um, we have run into those. that because it, especially for Nina, there were certain things that were tackled at different times. So you're right, I3 Appendix B is a historically been in conflict with CLDXF and then uh -huh. GIS data model was in conflict with CLDXF and Appendix B. And um, the uh, and those are being brought back into consistency. So right now there's a, a version two of CLDXF coming out, which is also expand it, that's expanding um, the sub addressing elements that informs PIDAflow, which is an IETF standard. So there's some things that we're trying to do from a 91 perspective that we actually have to go back to IETF and say, hey, could you modify your standard to support this? Yeah. And then. Um, Version two of GIS data models coming out, which is again cleaning up those relationships um, because it kind of goes CLDXF to PIDAflow to data model and then um, Appendix B. Because uh, that data model was interesting because there were things in um, some of the other standards that physically could not be. Right. I know which one you're. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. They took that out. Remember you okay. and I had that conversation? Uh -huh. They, yep, it they, doesn't exist. It's like they, you can't build it. Yeah, they researched that and they removed it. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, see, just a great example of uh, local awareness impacting national standards. So I'm going to step away real quick. I'm going to do a bio break and then we'll uh, we'll jump into some of what those standards are, though. Okay. Okay, so we only have about 45 minutes left and um, have a lot to cover still. So um, I'll try to move through this as quick as I can and 
Um, the, the next couple of slides that we're going to look at really are going back to if you were with us during the break, uh, Charles and I were t discussing other national standards that are out there to support next generation 911. And going back to what ne um, Annie was talking about, about understanding why the standards are built the way they are, why it's mandatory or conditional, why the field lengths, why all these things, it's to make it work within the system that it's, that it's built on. The, now I'm not going to go into a whole lot of heavy detail because I know this is, that wouldn't be what you want, and I'm not going to reference a ton of standards. There's just a couple of things I want to mention to you so you don't feel like you're floundering or that you don't have resources available to you. The Oklahoma standard is very, very detailed, but even as very detailed as it is, as it is you're still going to have questions on how do I do this, how do I populate it, hey, we handle our roads this way, I'm on a jurisdictional boundary with my road, what do I do? What does validation left and right mean? There's all these questions that you're gonna have. Please know that there's documents out there that can assist you. And I will, after this um, class is done, share out to you what I think are gonna be the most valuable ones for you to at least have handy. I'll even include a, a short description of what each one of those documents are gonna talk about, okay? Now, Again, this is not gonna be a high level of a detailed description, but again, to give you an understanding. Oops, hold on one second, I messed up my computer. I hate when you do that. It's not links, it's my computer. Okay. Within the next generation 911 system, remember when we, when we looked at how a 911 call flow happens, remember I said we have this ESINET and the ESINET has these protocols built into it that allow us to capture voice and data at the same time. And part of the data that we capture is the location elements at the time of a 911 call. For a civic addressing, that, locate, that, that uh, translation element or the, or the protocol that supports that is called PITA flow. The, Presence Information Data Flow Location Object. Um, PITAFLOW is an IETF standard. So this is a, an, an, an uh, international standard that is applied to multiple business industries. Uh, Uber, anything that is related to finding someone and getting them somewhere, it relies on this standard. So it's not like 911 uh, is making this stuff up as they go. They are uh, actually, you know, touching into existing standards that are being used, um, they're already tried and true. So why would we try to redevelop it, right? Now, the Civic Location Data Exchange format is a standard that helps inform the PITA flow elements. They work hand in hand together. And really what CLDXF is, is a marriage of 911 with the FGDC standard. If anybody's familiar with the fed, that federal standard, it's a marriage of those two. So FGDC as a whole couldn't support everything 911 needed. So it was a marriage between that and 911. Now, um, let me see how I wanted how we want to talk about this. So at the time of an 911 call, the caller's civic location is captured through the use of the internet protocol, the PITA flow. PITA flow uses, and this is the example of right here directly from the standard. XML format, extend, extensible markup language schema. And it, captured, it captures the civic location information in this specific format from the highest denominator to the lowest denominator. So you could see here at the top, it is actually utilizing country as the highest denominator. And in this example, the lowest denominator is room. This is the, all the elements that were, would be captured as part of this by one call. The PITA flow XML tags are correlated back to NG91 through the Civic Location Data Exchange Format Standard. The CLDXF maps a profile between PITA flow and the, civic core, uh, the core civic location data elements that you, we, you will populate through your G, the GIS data model provided in the Oklahoma schema. Your data, um, as supported by this standard, is going to prevent, provide all of those elements that the NG91 network needs through CLDXF in order to recognize the location of the call and do a point and polygon spatial query within the ECRF. And we already kind of covered that. So what does that mean? That means, so here, here is an example of the Nina Pitaflow elements. My 911 call was placed. 
I am in the US, I'm in the state of Ohio, I'm in the city of Columbus, I am on Airport Road, Actually, I'm actually on Airport Drive. Sorry, the RD threw me off. That's RD for road. I'm on Airport Drive. I'm at 2901 Airport Drive at the Courtyard Marriott. This is the postal code. This is the boardroom that I'm in, and I'm in boardroom B. So what does that mean to you? Well, from a highest to lowest denominator, when your 911 call comes in, it's going to start looking for data elements, OK? So it's going to know that you're in the US. It's going to look for Ohio. It's going to look for Columbus in the city field. It's going to look for the street name in the street name field. It's going to look for your street type. It's going to look for the house number. Now say that's all I have. Say if in my GIS, I don't have the sub addressing of the Court Riard Marriott. I don't have the postal code or I don't have the boardroom be built into my GIS. That's fine. The 911 system is going to stop at 2901. So 2901 Airport Drive in Columbus, Ohio, and it's going to see that in your GIS. It's going to geocode and it's going to do that point and polygon spatial query and it's going to route your call. Okay. The goal is that it be as complete as possible, right? If 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 the the actual standard itself has the ability to support all the way down to the seat. Then we want to, from a, a public safety, a public health response point of view, we want to be able to respond to that seat. So say I have a, a business and it has multiple cubicles, or I have a university and it's got, you know, multiple um, offices within, you know, the science building, we would like to be able to know that's where the call is and that's where I'm routing emergency responders. But in the next generation 911 network, we can only do that if the data exists. Otherwise, we're going to route the call based on as far in the data we can find it. Now, if 2901 Airport Drive doesn't exist, it's going to recognize Columbus, Ohio, and it's going to route based on a point and polygon query on Columbus, Ohio. And as, as long as there's only one 91 center for Columbus, Ohio, you're golden. But if there's multiple 91 centers, that could create a problem, right? Because now we're just doing it from the, the, the last Denom you know, denominator between your GIS data and the information that was collected at the time of the 911 call. I hope, I hope that's um, an easy enough explanation. I don't know if it's really easy, to be honest with you. Um, but know that there are resources out there to help you. So not only will Annie go in and talk about what are those resources in your standard, but what I will send to you um, folks afterwards is uh, the CLDXF document. Um, gosh darn it, I keep having trouble with my mouse. Let me grab this again. So the CLDXF document is here. There um, not only is a description of every field um, that, that is within the document and examples, but if you go to the bottom of the document, um, there are different ways. Um, it will show you different ways across the nation how people have populated. So if you're just stuck, like when do I use the city uh, attribution versus an, an unincorporated versus a neighborhood versus a whatever, right? This will, um, depending on your unique situation, I can almost guarantee you're going to find an example that's out there that's going to help you figure this out. Um, as well, um, I, what we discussed during the break, I co-chair uh, the GIS data stewardship for Next Generation 9-1 for Nina. Uh, the PSAP boundary document is already out there. It describes what it is, where your breaks are supposed to be, how to develop one. We are uh, currently have two more working groups going on right now, Road Centerline. We are uh, wrapping up our uh, recommendations and best practices. That'll be going into an approval process, as well as service boundaries. There's also another information document out there about address points. It's a site structure address point document. I'll include all this. I'll send it after the class but know that there's help for you out there. Okay, Miss Annie, this one's for you. No, that was great. Thank you, Sandy, I appreciate that. I hope I hope that was very thorough uh, for everyone out there. I just, I like to know why I have to structure my data a certain way, especially if I'm already maintaining it. Maybe I'm a curmudgeon, I don't know. That's just that's just what I like to, to understand how, how it actually works in the end. Um, so really, we can look at the standard and these um, were screenshots that were taken directly out of the standard that we just looked at. 
Okay. Um, so for the address points data, we have address number elements, and those indicate um, basically where along a right of way or a thoroughfare the number is found. Okay. And that would be the address uh, prefix, the address, the address suffix, and then the mile post. Okay. Um, sub addressing elements um, are those are optional or conditional, I think, um, within the standard. But but basically what a sub address element does is it further describes um, an address that is um, part of another building, okay, or part of another campus. Okay, so really you can find sub addressing in many different ways. And that standard that um, Sandy just referenced, the um, informational document from Nina that we're gonna send to you guys, that has a ton of information about sub addressing and best practices. Okay, so sub addressing, um, again, the, the standard allows for uh, maintaining that information down to the seat level. Now, whether or not you want to to do this is really a local discussion. Um, it's going to be very resource intensive, especially if you live in a very populated city um, where you have, you know, tons of office buildings. You just have to have to understand that that's a tremendous undertaking to maintain data down to that level. Okay, and so these are the fields that are in the standard as far as the sub addressing. So um, you have the additional location information, which is not something that can be identified as part of an official address, but it's more of like a description. Um, you have the building name, the floor, uh, the unit type, the room, and then of course the seat. So an address descriptor, um, it describes basically the place type. Okay, so is it an airport? Is it a hotel? Um, is it a library, et cetera? And there is a place type field in the standard for that information, and you can see it's optional. And then of course the street elements, it's, it's very rare that you're gonna have a street that's got all eight of these, um, but just being aware that these do pertain to the way that street data appears within uh, your GIS and it's uh, indicated here in the standard. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that screenshot. So these are the uh, street name elements um, in the address points. And again, you can see for some of those, they do have domains associated with them. Okay, and then country, state, and place name elements. Um, obviously, you know, United States, you know, your state's going to be Oklahoma, and then your respective county and city municipality. Um, there is room in there for your postal community and your postal code, um, as well as any unofficial um, recognitions like your neighborhood, hamlets, etc. And that's what these fields look like. And then again, um, since you don't want to have to type out Oklahoma every single time, uh, certain fields are associated with domains. And you do need to see here that they are mandatory. You do need to maintain those. But the domains make it easy. And the domains are going to be helpful, especially on uh, if you have streets that have um, our boundary to another state. So be mindful of, of those that, you know, are sitting on a state line where, um, you know, obviously the side of the road that's sitting in Oklahoma would say Oklahoma, and then on the other side of the road may indicate a different state. And then of course, like in Arizona, we have international that we also have to accommodate to. Yep. Okay, so landmark elements um, really just is kind of like an alternate name um, by which something is known. Okay, so uh, there is space in the schema, of course, for this as well, um, and it is a conditional field. Okay, so um, the important thing to note here is that we do need to follow um, the basic addressing standards, but be aware that they are they are similar among the different data sets. So when you're looking at the uh, publication 28, which is for USPS, um, as well as um, your E91 example, um, it is going to be fairly consistent across our data sets as far as the data is concerned. Um, so hopefully none of this will be like a huge surprise, but I hope that, um, you know, this will be pretty easy to make that association. Okay, so road center lines are another data set which you must maintain at the local level and submit to the repository.
Okay, so um, we did mention earlier that road center lines also include uh, transportation fields that are specifically related to public safety applications. Okay, and we could take a look at those here in just a second. Um, so they are not essential to the core NG91 schema. You do have to have the fields present. Okay, they need to be there regardless of whether or not you populate them. Okay, and if we scroll, I think the road center lines is the next one. Yeah, okay. So you can see that the road center line uh, data contains many of the same fields as the addressing. Annie, I'm gonna try again. I could have sworn I clicked the road center line <laughs> okay. one and it did not go okay. there at all. No, it's not okay. I apologize to everybody. There we go. Yeah, so it's going to include, obviously, those top three fields that we talked about before, the discrepancy agency ID, the NGU ID, and the agency ID. Again, those are mandatory fields across all of the data sets. And it's also going to include a lot of the same information um, that you would find in the address point schema, especially, obviously, as it concerns the road name, right, because it, it has to associate with an address point. Um, it also is going to include some information about ranges. Um, parity, which refers to even and odd, um, and then it does break out the the different street name elements, like I said, very similar to the address point schema. And then I also wanted to call your attention to the fact that there are various uh, domains that have been set up or that are required of the data. And again, we are going to talk about that in the toolkit class. Um, but yeah, just an overview of the uh, road center line schema. It's all laid out very, very similar. And then you do have these transportation elements, but again, you don't have to maintain those, um, but you do have to have the fields present. Okay, so your ESZ boundary is also maintained at the local level and submitted to the repository. Many of you are already using ESZ boundaries, um, or you may call them ESNs or response zones or fireboxes. I don't know, people call them different things um, in my experience but we can pull up that standard briefly and just take a look at those because that's not a huge, that's not a huge schema. So I, I want you to notice here um, these fields. Now, a lot of us have been maintaining ESD or ESN boundaries for a long time, and it may include a lot of extensive data, right? So we might have lots and lots of different data within our ESDs. But the important thing to note here, again, and I, I know I don't want to beat the, the horse to death, okay, but this is just what the state is requiring for submission. So if you guys are maintaining a lot of extra um, information within your schema for your existing ESDs, then keep doing that, okay? The toolkit will help you transform this data into what it needs to look like for submission. All right, and again, you see that the discrepancy agency ID, the NGU ID, and the agency are all at the top because those are mandatory fields. Okay, so uh, part of NextGen 911 involves maintaining, um, creating a lot of times for most of us, creating individual service boundaries for fire, law, and EMS. Okay, and these are just used as another call routing boundary, um, but this is going to be new to a lot of us. And basically what this means is that you're going to have an individual um, data layer for your fire response, your law response, and your EMS. And those are broken out. The schema is essentially the same, but it's broken out by layer within the standard so that there's no confusion. Okay, again, showing those, so showing those very standard fields at the top, those required fields. And then there are some additional fields for um, service URN and service URI. And Sandy, I, I don't have a good understanding of those. I don't know if you can shed some light on that information. So uh, part of the reason, so for GIS professionals, um, really in your GIS data development, having the field there is really all that you need. Um, just ensure that the field is available. Because once an NG Core Service Provider is brought on board, 
Um, a lot of times uh, that information will either be provided by your NG core service provider for population or here uh, a domain has been built for the service URNs. So as part of that uh, new network, that ESINet network and the, and the capture of information, a service URI will be captured. It will say, I'm looking for a PSAP to route to, I'm looking for a fire response, I'm looking for EMS, I'm looking for law enforcement. But a service URI is developed. It's going to be looking at your GIS. This is how the point and polygon query happens. It's going to be looking at your GIS to say, do I see a corresponding service URI? It will say yes or no. And then it will report back the service URN as to what is the next hop in that call transfer. So not only is it saying, hey, this is where you route. This is the PSAP that routes the call, but this is actually uh, the phone number, if you will, in IP format on how to get that call there. Your GIS is so important to Next Generation 91. It doesn't just visually represent um, your, your geographic area. It actually communicates with the call and makes the call happen. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, so uh, the PSAP is actually one layer that is going to be maintained at the state level, okay? And that, that layer is going to be housed in the repository. So that layer has um, a schema associated with it, obviously, but that is going to be provided by the state as well as the discrepancy agency ID. Okay, so both of those data sets you don't have to worry about creating, those are gonna be maintained at the state level. Okay, but they do have schema associated with them as well. And then there is that change process that was identified earlier. Yes. So if, if you do have a change request, uh, just refer back to the document. Okay. Uh, the standard also outlines recommended layers, um, which obviously they're recommended, they're not required, but they do help um, with the call process uh, just not at the level where they're required. Okay, so these these are things that you might want to look at. Um, definitely prioritize getting your GIS data next gen ready um, for the required layers, and then I would move on to uh, the recommended layers after that. But just to let you know that these are out there. And a lot of times these um, recommended layers are going to be quality assurance checks for um, your points lines and um, your points lines and other polygons. And the same with these as well. So some railroads and hydro, all of that is just kind of supplemental for reference. Okay, so data quality and accuracy. Um, let's go ahead, Sandy, and go through those quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for the class module, which um, is going to be uh, coming very soon. So um, as Actually, far as the data Annie, quality. I would pay more attention to this. The, the last one can okay. be read through on its own. We built those in case we ran out of time that folks could read them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, ma'am. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Okay. So when we talk about data quality from a GIS perspective, we need to think about it um, in, in different ways. Okay. So we need to look at it from an accuracy perspective, uh, from a currency or a timeliness perspective, uh, consistency, and then completeness. All right. And we're going to talk about those things soon. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the state um, has provided uh, basically some standards for positional accuracy. Um, it's it's really it's really located in the standard. Um, I I don't want to read this off the slide to you guys, but basically um, it's about achieving the accuracy that's required for NG911. So there is a section in the standard for that. And when we talk about accuracy versus precision, um, these are some parcel lines that we've brought in with building footprints and address points. And within these uh, parcels, we do have an address point, okay? The address point is on the parcel. So it is accurate in that way, okay? But if we, if we look and see how can we improve our data quality, and this goes back to address point placement, if we place that address point on the structure, it's precise, okay? So that's the difference there. Accurate, yeah, you're kind of in the ballpark, you're, you're on the property, but precision matters as well. 
okay? So from a spatial reference standpoint, again, the most important thing here is going to be that WGS84 coordinate system. And again, the standard is going to help you with that transformation that's required to submit. And the toolkit is definitely going to help as well. Okay, so as far as the content, um, really, you need to make sure that the individual components, the fields are present and that they contain the correct information. Okay, make sure that the mandatory fields are populated. Um, and if you have information for the conditional fields, fill them out. Um, the data needs to be correct for the location. Okay, again, this goes back to the precision aspect. Okay, we can route someone to, to a place, but locating where they are is extremely important. Okay, we can get somebody to a park, but if they're at a shelter or at a ball field, that's going to help us even more. All right, so the data has to be correct um, in terms of the uh, sequential aspect. Um, you you want to make sure that your addresses are in order. Addressing is for public safety, guys. It's not for mail, and a lot of people have a hard time with this. Um, the goal of, and purpose of an addressing system is to get people, to get emergency responders to a location, uh, and that involves maintaining that data to a logical and consistent order, all right? And the data should be uh, current and valid. Um, so what do we mean by current? Well, ideally, we want the uh, data to be as live as possible. Um, updating your CAD system, you know, once every three months is not good enough. It's not going to be good enough, okay? Um, a, a lot of vendors are still behind as far as um, receiving live updates from GIS, but you do need to take a look at your update process for your public safety systems and make sure that, uh, that the data is getting in there pretty much um, within three business days because, again, that's the standard, right? When, when errors are reported out of the spatial interface, um, you are expected to correct those within three business days. Okay, so we're not going to go through each one of these, but just be advised that the standard does outline um, some best practices for ensuring address consistency, and these are defined extensively within the standard. But I just wanted to add these to the slide there so that you can see. But again, the reference is there at the bottom of the screen. It's in section 2.13, and it basically gives you some guidance for how to ensure the addressing consistency through these elements. Okay, so as far as completeness, we can really look at completeness from two different angles, okay? We wanna make sure that number one, all, all of the layers are there. Are you maintaining all of the layers? And once those are there, are all of the attributes present, okay? Does your schema match what the standard is mandating? Okay, and then furthermore, are those attributes filled in where appropriate? Are all of the mandatory fields filled in? Okay, and then we also wanna make sure that all of our features are represented within the layer. So think about it like this. I mean, what are the implications if you're missing address points? Uh, we work with a lot of people who um, are missing huge chunks of data from their addressing, either because there's poor communication with their municipalities or just because they haven't had a consistent means to collect and store and manage the address points in GIS. So these are some considerations that we need to think about when we talk about completeness. And folks, I wanna reinforce, it's not just completeness within every data layer, but how complete is, um, is it between data layers? So again, if I have an address point that's sitting within a PSAP, PSAP A boundary polygon, when that call comes in and it hits the address point, it's gonna hit PSAP A. But if for some reason that point's not found and it falls to the road center line, but that, that geocode actually places it in PSAP B, it's now routing to the wrong place. So it's the completeness of your data for every data layer, but then the completeness of the data layers as they relate to each other. That's what's gonna best support NG911. Okay, so just one last poll, folks, and this is really um, hope, hoping just to kind of get some thoughts going. Um, but how how do you plan to migrate or maintain your NG91 GIS data? And so the options out there are in-house. I'm going to utilize my COG or GIS department that supports me. 
um, heck, I need a third party vendor, or you know what, a reasonable answer is, I don't know, we need to talk about that. I, I wouldn't surprise me if folks come out of today going, I don't know, we need to talk about that. Because even though we have processes in place, um, I think the earlier discussion even identified that we have this new element of a workflow that may have to come in and, and support us. Um, folks, I'm, I'm not gonna tattle on you. So, um, you know, it, don't be afraid to respond because you think I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Charles and Charles is gonna come after you with his ugly stick. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it really is. Ouch. <laughs> Well, I didn't say you were ugly. I said you had an ugly stick. Um, but it does help the state to understand kind of where uh, where you think you're going to be in, as far as your data migration and maintenance for NT911. So Charles did post in the chat, the accuracy state in the standard is based on the latest NAEP imagery accuracy standards and ensures that if a feature is collected with a GPS device, it is a GPS device that can achieve a similar accuracy. Uh, for example, not Google Earth or iPhone data collection. And then Charles, I believe this follow-up question is for you in the chat. If Google Earth and iPhone data doesn't match the level of accuracy, what kind of GPS device would be acceptable? Pretty much anything that's gonna be, by the time that you're doing an entire, um, Data collection with a with a PSAP or a 911 agency um, or a contractor, it needs to be a GPS. It's got some kind of differential correction. It needs to be something that's not a consumer grade. It's going to be a professional grade. There's a lot of options out there, and it's. I mean, you can even get things that Bluetooth to your phone that are just a collection device, but they have a different level of accuracy than just your phone. Right. So there's a lot of options out there that didn't exist five years ago that are very reasonable and they get your accuracy much, much, much better and can and can attest to the accuracy. The iPhone can get good some days, bad some days. You don't know the difference and that's the scary part. You don't know where it's good and where it's bad. Did that answer the question for you? Yes, I believe so. I'm just trying to get started with all this brand new stuff. Understood. There are a lot of options out there. Probably the, the simplest would be something that Bluetooth to your phone that gets a a decent level of accuracy, you know, a few meters. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So most folks are going to support themselves in-house. Um, which is uh, actually consistent with what we see uh, across the nation is in in-house. Of course, Oklahoma does have COGS that support them um, as well as um, it's not unusual for like uh, the PSAP to be supported by a GIS department. Generally, what we see in the conversation is, I, I know I have a decent GIS department that does this. I don't know if I know everybody who does it for me though. And that may be one of the relationship building aspects that you um, may wanna consider. Um, third party vendor is also another valuable option, um, especially when uh, resource, not necessarily, not just financial, but uh, um, people, time, hours, too many commitments when you're feeling like your, your resource, um, uh, how do I want to say it, um, exhausted that bringing in someone else to help. You still have to, even if you bring in a third party vendor, you have to participate with your vendor because there are just some things that a vendor is not gonna be able to answer on behalf of the community, but there should be a process in there um, to help you uh, participate in your project in a way that works within your uh, resource exhaustion. And I don't know, we need to talk about that. That's absolutely a viable answer and I, I actually want to challenge you that even if you think you know what you're going to do, uh, if you uh, haven't taken the time to build the relationships, to consider what workflows are going to look like, who needs to participate in those workflows, um, to start those discussions as well, because uh, I think it's going to be very revealing. Uh, our stakeholder group from an NG91 perspective moves beyond police, uh, law, fire, um, law, law, fire, EMS, and the PSAP. It now includes IT departments, it includes GIS departments, public works, um, your elections, uh, the state, your stakeholder uh, group is, is growing exponentially with, with, this type of, uh, with this type of support for 911. And embrace it, because these are people here that will help you. 
Okay, well, I put in a break, but we actually have 12 minutes left, and we do want to get into some tips and tricks for you. Is there any other questions for Annie? Oops, I forgot to start my video. I'm sorry, folks. That was rude of me. I shouldn't have been talking at you without my video on. Okay, some tips and tricks. It's going to be include, as Annie's mentioned over and over, it's going to be important to include all the fields um, that are identified in the standard, especially if they're mandatory. Um, the conditional, if the data exists and it needs to be populated, but they are conditional. So if they don't, there's no, inf there's no information to populate. A lot of the optional fields folks are going to be important to your local business needs. So before just discarding your optional fields, see whether or not they should be completed as well as the transportation fields. Um, the legacy fields that will help you in your transition and your local business needs a lot of times are conditional and not mandatory. Um, so really want to encourage you to, to populate those because I can almost guarantee as a conditional field, you probably have data that goes in it. Um, you want to include legacy fields, like I mentioned, for your transition. Ensure that your locality's addresses are in the correct PSAP boundary. Um, the PSAP boundary file is on state are on file with the state. Um, so you may want to go take a look at that and ensure that you're working towards uh, full completeness of your data within um, those PSAP boundaries. If you're finding that you have data that's falling outside of it and that's legitimate, please work with the change request process to be able to open those com that communication with the um, OGI um, and the state 91 coordinator to get those resolved. The state is, uh, they are very interested in making sure that this is right. So um, opening that dialogue with them is something that they're expecting and that they're encouraging unless uh, Charles or Shelly jumps in here and says, no, no, tell them not to call me. And then focus on call compiling. Shelley. <laughs> call Shelly. <laughs> Please focus on compiling those complete data sets. Um, folks, I don't mean to sound um, dire about this, but a life's gonna depend on it. You have become, uh, what was the term that uh, Annie you used the other day? Uh, geospatial first responders? Exactly. Yeah, and that's a true statement. Um, that's exactly the role that you're going to be performing. Um, own it and um, run with it. You're going to find that it actually is a, a really valuable position to be in. Your road center lines are going to be um, a lot of the same uh, concerns that you're going to have as your address points. Remember your topology. We need to remove duplicate lines. We have to be able to snap to our, at, at a minimum our PSAP boundary, if not um, municipal or otherwise. Uh, I know current guidance uh, that is going to be coming out in the road centerline document, uh, GIS data stewardship, that basically if you have an attribute change, you should be um, breaking your, you should be breaking at every attribute change in your road centerline. Of course, take any types of best practices or standards and apply them thoughtfully to how you do business locally, okay? And then address ranges, take a look and see whether or not hypothetical or actual address ranges are better for your community. Um, and regardless of which ones that you decide to do, ensure that they're complete. Where uh, 911 is going to be relying on the completeness of the geography that you place into the network to support 911 calls. 80% of calls are going to be geodetic in nature, which means we need to be able to clearly identify what our boundaries look like and where that should be going. And then for service boundaries, the same thing. This may require some research um, if you're starting from a new or from po political boundaries. What's gonna be important when you're working with service boundaries, because sometimes jurisdictional and political are, are hot words, um, reassure anyone you're having conversations with that what your goal is is proper 911 call routing and proper response. Uh, we understand jurisdictional and, politi and, and political boundaries or political needs um, fall within that. But sometimes uh, from 9 call routing point of view, I'm going to use the county boundary, not because politically or jurisdictionally it's the right boundary, but because that best supports my 911 call. Um, and the only reason I, I bring that up is that uh, for, for some communities, uh, how, the words that we use mean have very specific meanings. Um, and a lot of times boundaries are uh, honestly sometimes sitting in courts. Uh, debating uh, litigation on whose is what, and you don't want to get pulled into that discussion. So just be very clear about um, 
the words that you're using and why you're what what the intent is of using those boundaries and make sure it's in your metadata folks i can't i can't tell you how many times i've done a gis project and i i the question i would ask is why does that boundary look that way do we know how it looks that way what what made the decision for that boundary nobody knows nobody knows what decided that boundary would look that way well we need to know so make sure that not only as you're developing these, you're having thoughtful processes, you're thinking this through with your neighbors, and that all of that is documented, not only in your metadata, but you may want to have an agreement in place. And the reason that I mentioned the agreement is a lot of times that uh, when we're dealing with GIS data, we're used to putting a disclaimer on our GIS data that says, hey, folks, kind of use it your own risk, we're doing our best, but there might be errors. When I place an I want call, there won't be a disclaimer that pops up on my phone that says, hey, guess what? There might be errors, use at your own risk, opt in to place your call. The only way we can mitigate our risk is when we do the, the proper data development, the proper data management, and that's all clear and identifiable through our metadata and through the agreements that we have in place. Let's protect ourselves in this process, all right? Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these slides. Like I mentioned, there was a lot of slides that were added to the end that just so if you, when you receive it, you could read through them yourselves. But just realize that um, there are going to be a lot more people that um, coordination is going to need, may need to happen within the future, either in the development or maintenance or understanding of the data set. And for public safety folks, realize that um, when you if, if you're at a starting point where you're trying to figure this out and you're going out to a bunch of folks to ask about GIS data, realize that um, you may run into some obstacles and some roadblocks and that's okay because it's really just an education effort on both of your part. Um, you could go to your, uh, your addressing department and say, do you have an address point layer? And they would be like, well, yeah, we have an address point layer. Well, can I use it for 911? Oh, no, I don't know. That's pretty risky. I don't know. We don't feel good enough about our data. We don't whatever. Or wow, even your GIS department may say, well, I maintain the data, but I don't own it. You actually have to go talk to this person first before I can let you use it for that purpose. Just realize that those conversations may have to happen. Uh, just don't run away from them. And then if you do need some help, um, by all means, bring a consultant in and, and get some help. And a, a consultant can support you from a strategic planning point of view. Uh, like I mentioned, from a data development and maintenance point of view, it sounds like quite a few of you already are utilizing a third party vendor uh, to support your current GIS data. And you may just want to open the discussion, um, if necessary, about you know their ability to support you in an NG91 environment as well, knowing that's going to be an additional level of assistance that you may need. Um, now, the question always comes down to, how do I know if I need assistance? Well, you're probably coming out of today's discussion feeling a little bit overwhelmed, so you might think you, you do. Um, again, from a state, from the state's point of view, there is grant funds that are available, the federal grant, and then I believe uh, there's also state grants that are available every year. You're able to apply for those grants, the state grant, once a year. And Shelley or Charles or Barb's going to jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong on those that grant cycle. Um, there are restrictions on what the grant could be used for, but um, please take a look at that grant information. Again, grants are there to get you started, but we also have to consider the long-term maintenance of our data and what those relationships look like and where that funding is going to come from, though. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, factors that you're going to have to look at to see whether or not you need assistance. A lot of times, like I mentioned, it's going to become resource exhaustion and whether or not you even have the time to get it done, or uh, you may feel that you have a knowledge gap. Um, just know that there are, just like um, Lance mentioned at the beginning of the call, there are resources that, that have been placed on state contract who are vetted that can assist you with this process as long as the, and as well, the dollars are, um, are available to you as well. You will have to perform GIS to legacy data set, the Alley and MSAG comparison. So if a vendor comes to you and says, hey, can I have your Alley and your MSAG so can I run these comparisons? That is a natural part of the process. It's actually built into uh, NINA standard 71501 is a legitimate process of assessing what is 911 today and is my GIS supporting everything that it needs to or better um, 
from that perspective. So if, if there's a request for this data, don't become alarmed. Um, just know that this is a common practice. The one thing I would encourage though with your alley records is before you share that out, strip out any proprietary information. Your GIS vendor doesn't need that. We don't need the customer name. We don't need the telephone number. We just need to know what the location is um, and the ESN and that type of thing. Strip out the proprietary information and then that way um, no confidential information is actually being shared out beyond your agency. It's an easy way to solve any concerns. Um, you may also find that um, software tools, um, so again, the state has a toolkit. The next class will be on the, the toolkit. The final class will be on the portal. Um, but then you may also find that for your internal processes that you, you may want something else. The state is not opposed to whatever, however you feel you need to maintain your data, um, but know that the toolkit is there if, if you're not sure which way to go. And I won't, um, like I said, I'm not going to go into every single slide because we are at the top of the hour. I want to give a quick moment to see if there is any final questions that we can help you with. Okay, well, um, thank you, Annie, for doing this with me today. Thank you to the state team for participating today. You, your participation was super valuable to us especially with some of the questions that we wouldn't necessarily have visibility to answer for the, for the attendees. Um, there was a question that was asked early on whether or not uh, classes could be attended again. Um, the answer is yes, uh, you can be, you will, if there's a class you wanna attend again, cause it was just too overwhelming this time, you think you need a second bat at it. Um, just let us know, we do need seats to go to folks who haven't, um, had this information yet, but as long as there's a seat available, we're happy to uh, to let you participate in that. Shelly or Charles, did you have any final comments? No, just thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Sandy and Andy, Annie for, for the wonderful course. Thank you for all your time. And um, if anybody has any questions as you go forward, feel free to contact any one of us. Yeah, much appreciated. Y'all did a great Thanks. job on that one. And, and I know it starts, it starts more questions than answers, but that's the first thing to do is, is find out. That's what GIS does really well. It finds where the questions are at and we go from there, so. Well, at least GIS gives you all the means to analyze it and come out with answers. Yep. All right, fantastic so, folks. Hope to work with you We've in the got future. it in-house, so if we have any questions, feel free to holler at us and we may not have the answers, but we'll find them. Thank you, everyone. Let's see what else everybody rolls through.